Welcome back, Simon and Patrick. I am really excited. Again, we have part two of our conversation. This is taking place on a different today. Uh, different day. Today is 13 August 2023. And I am really pleased to bring back Simon Shack and Patrick Holmquist. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, David. My pleasure. Thank you, David. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm sitting here in a garden of my neighbor, and it's uh, surrounded by trees with very loud cicadas. Yeah. So you can hear them in the background, <laughs> I guess. And uh, right. I, there's nothing I can do about it. So excuse the the, the background noise. No, it's, I like the uh, the sound of the cicadas. is is something we have in the U.S. mostly in places when I was in the army. <laughs> very hot. Uh, southeastern states where they put all the army bases and army posts <laughs> and I remember all the cicadas but I think actually cicadas have a celestial cycle or something like a 13-year cycle or a 17-year cycle so it's very appropriate that we have cicadas in the background so welcome <laughs> I've uh I've I've got a little graphic here and let me share my screen of the topics that I hope we can cover today, and I've shared this with Simon and Patrick beforehand to, um, to structure our discussion today. So I'm going to use my um, Christmas tree analogy. I thought we could go through these different Christmas presents and unwrap one at a time. <laughs> Take as much time as you want to unwrap each one, but these are the the broad outline that I wanted to suggest that we start with an overview of the Tycho's mm -hmm. model down in the bottom left. We move into the question of stellar mm -hmm. parallax and we move all the way through those different parts to the finish line and we'll pause after each present. So if that is, uh, if that's a good structure, we'll try and hit all those topics that'll give our listeners kind of the broad overview and I know we've talked about it in the last time, but if 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 we could start off with a broad overview of the Tycho's model from Simon, and yes. I uh, I just wanted to start off. I found this diagram on Wikimedia Commons. It's not actually written by the hand of Tycho Brahe himself, but one of uh, the books about him written in the 1600s. So Tycho died in. Kind of mysterious circumstances, untimely, untimely early death in 1601. So this was published, I think, in 1650 or something like that, maybe about 40 years after. But you can see this diagram. It says hypothesis Tychonica. I'm just going to show it for our listeners, and then you can take it from there as we get into the the way that you've updated this but i just i found it so fascinating the rings here you can see the astrological symbol of mars jupiter and saturn and then yeah. the uh artist has put luna circuit so that's the circuit of the moon there so that must be earth right there and then here this circle says solar circuit so it's got the sun's circuit yeah. intersecting with mars as we can see, mm -hmm. and then going around the sun are Mercury and Venus. So and, from here, <laughs> yeah. So from here, you've updated it, and I'm going to just let you take it from there. I took this picture out of your online book of the Tychosium, and then I added just for uh, viewers to see there's Jupiter and Saturn. I just added those in. They're not to scale from the Tychosium, but I put those down at the yes. bottom. And it's mm -hmm. very similar. I'll I'll leave it there just for everyone to get a good look at it. And then I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to you, Simon, to and Patrick. Both mm -hmm. please feel free to jump in. Let's unwrap this first present under the tree of just give us the broad overview of this whole system. Yes, I will. I have actually prepared um a new slideshow in view of the um the Stockholm conference that Patrick and I will do uh, on the 3rd of September. So I have some new slides and uh, I've done what you asked 
your your Christmas wish list. I have tried <laughs> to follow it as much as possible. And so, shall I share my screen now? Maybe. Yes, I've I've turned it so you should be able to share. Check it out. See if you okay. can. Okay. Right. Is this uh, working? Yes, I see it. Okay. So yes, uh, what you showed was um, the, the Tycho Brahe system, which is very similar to the Tycho's. What I have added is basically one thing, and it's the Earth's own orbits, because he didn't give or, uh, an orbit to Earth. So, uh, you know, we have it here on this. I can show it quickly. This here, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. So this blue, the PVP orbit, is what I've added to Tycho Brahe's model, basically. The rest is identical, you could say, to Tycho Brahe's model. Uh, what he was saying was that Earth was totally immobile, uh, although his uh, trusty assistant, Longo Montanus, uh, when he wrote the final book of Tycho's research, he included a 24-hour rotation of the Earth. So they came that far, and I think they were just missing one important thing, Earth's orbit. And, you know, every single body in the sky has an orbit, even the stars, as we shall see. So why would the Earth be the only one without an orbit? So I think it's, you know, logically, it makes sense that it has an orbit and it is the product, the consequence of the entire system while it re revolves anticlockwise, all of these planets, all of our planets revolve anticlockwise. It also, there's a precession, a clockwise precession on itself. So dragging virtually the Earth around this blue orbit in 25,000 years. 25,344 or 45 years. So I will start with uh, the first question of this uh, brief overview of the Tycho model here, slide one. So I just asked the question straight away. Could it be that 100% of the stars have a binary companion? Well, I, I say now today, I would say most probably yes. I was very um, cautious at the beginning to say that, to ask this question, but I'm now ready to do that because uh, 10 years ago when I started this, or yeah, eight years ago, I read about uh, the, the Heinz, Wolf Heinz was the uh, top authority in binary stars at the time, in the 80s. And he, at the end of his career, he said that, yeah, at least 85% of all the stars are binaries. But since then, we've been finding binaries all the time. Uh, every single day almost, you know, uh, all observatories have been just finding binary stars of the binary stars. The last one was, they actually found in 2016, that's not long ago, we found a companion of Proxima, our clo closest star. So you can imagine how difficult it is to find these companions because they are small. So here we have a classic example of a binary star, a big one, A, and a small one, B. <clears throat> in the <clears throat> Tychos, this would be the Sun, A, and V would be Mars. Just like Sirius has Sirius A and Sirius B. And as we shall see, their relative proportions are, are identical. So Sirius A and Sirius B are identical to the Sun and Mars. But let's go, let's go ahead. So, you know, I did this funny, <laughs> funny graphic here to show how ridiculous it would be to think that we would be like this. This is a heliocentric model, the Copernican model, and all the others would be binary stars, you know, because that's what we are seeing. We are seeing all around us binary stars. But they saying that we are not binary. We have the sun in the middle. The sun doesn't have a small orbit of its own in the heliocentric model. It, it has an orbit, but it, it would last for 250 million years to go around the galaxy. So the sun here would be a complete uh, exception of this rule that all stars have a companion 
and all stars, big or small, have a small local orbit. I call these local orbits. They can be bigger or smaller, but all the stars, all the stars around us, uh, at least the closest hundred stars, but even closest thousand stars, I think. Uh, I think because I haven't found any, I don't know of a single star really that is confirmed single. They probably have, <clears throat> haven't found all the, the companions yet. So when I went to India in 2016, I was very pleased and surprised to find it. I went to see a, a veteran astronomer, a very nice man, who gave me his book about his Indian, Indian astronomy. And in this book, I found this. And I said, who did this? Oh, uh, so I learned it was uh, a man called Patani Samanta. And he's considered the absolute top uh, naked eye observer of all time in India. And he had arrived to the same conclusion as Tycho Brahe. You can see these two models are identical. They are practically identical. With So what's, what's the main feature here? Well, in Tycho Brahe's model, as well as here, I've, I've, I've done this red and yellow to show them. Red is Mars, yellow is the sun, and the same here. And, and Tani Samantha has, uh, has Venus and Mercury going around the sun because they are the moons of the sun, as we shall see. But something is missing right here, and that is the PVP orbit, which we will talk a lot about. This PVP orbit <clears throat> is, is my addition, is my completion of Tycho Brahe's model and Patani Samantha's model. And uh, how I came to, you know, find out its diameter is, is a long story, but it's all described in the book. But what you have to just get in your mind is that uh, the Earth is doing this in 25,000 years. So now we were, today we are under Polaris. In 12,000 years, we'll be under Vega. And then we we'll go back to Polaris and hence PVP. Polaris, Vega, Polaris. So <clears throat> now, this, what, is it, what is this? The North Star Ring. This is the PVP orbit practically projected up in the sky. So if you look up, <clears throat> this, is, this is from uh, an astronomy site. I didn't do this uh, graphic. And uh, you see now today we are under Polaris. And we know that we were under Tuban 5,000 years ago, approximately. I mean, the Egyptians told us that Tuban was a North Star. And now we are here. And here we're going, we're going, we're going. You see, it's, it's anti-clockwise here because it's a projection up in the sky. But it's clockwise. The PVP orbit is clockwise. In 12,000 years, we will be under Vega here, close to Vega. And then we come back to Polaris. So that is the PVP orbit that... I, I use this North Star ring to, you know, wrap my mind around what could be creating precession. Why are we changing pole stars, uh, you know, in several thousand years? Why do we change pole stars? Well, we have a physical motion, very simply. We are the ones going around doing this, the PVP orbit. And here it's illustrated from side view, you could say, if you were in a spaceship and we came to earth here you, you would see this you would see you now this would be today if you see my mouse you do right here we are today yep yep we see it and we are under polaris now it's up north this is our north star and down here we have sigma octantis which is our current south pole star then we are going to go around this pvp orbit in twelve thousand years we'll be here will be on this other side, under Vega, as you see here. And our south star will be Columba. Um, so this is the, you know, this cone shaped uh, thing I made to, to show how it works. And the, 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 the Earth is always tilted at uh, 23.5 degrees, maybe changes a little over time, but now we are at 23.5. And so we're always lying this way outside. I mean, leaning outside towards the sun, towards the sun's orbit. The sun is going around us, right? 
Now, <clears throat> this is a very important um, topic, very important diagram. I call this the um, a man's yearly path. What is it? Well, it is very simply, but you need time to wrap your head around it. But <clears throat> let me let me. I mean, this is this talk of it is what a man will do in one year. So to explain to the kids, I, I usually say, you see, <clears throat> when uh, my mother died, I did a big bonfire in the garden. So if she had filmed that from the, from the heavens, she would have seen a bonfire here in March. And if I kept doing bonfires every day, every night for her, she, she would film it, maybe time-lapse film, and she would see this uh, being created. This chocolate she would have on her on her photographic plate. You understand? So a man doing, the, I mean, an astronomer looking at a star for one year, he will see the star doing this, obviously. So you will going, you are going to ask now, is this what is observed? Are they seeing stars doing this? Yes, indeed. Here, they are seeing stars doing this. Okay, this is Vega, a three-year period of Vega. And not the three to one ratio, because it's a length, the sideways displacement is three to one, three to one, three to one. But let me go back here for a second. So this is the trochoidal path or the mass yearly path. So keep that very much in mind because it's absolutely crucial. It explains three important things in our solar system. The first one is it explains the analemma. An analemma is the shape that the sun will do over a year. If you photograph the sun doing what I said before with a bonfire, you will get this shape, an H shape. And strangely enough, it will be three times larger below and just one part above. So it's a three to one ratio. Here we go, three to one. And you see, this one will be shorter and this will be three times longer. And that is, <clears throat> where we can get to an, a second explanation uh, that uh, the shockwave explains. Okay, here we see, you know, I, I, uh, someone did this uh, photograph for a year, the sun doing this is one to three, three to one. So the NLM reflects our annual shockwave motion. And this is the reason for a need of the equation of time because uh, we, we, our clocks can't do this. Our clocks go around in a circle, but we do a chocolate. So that's why the clocks will only be exact four times a year. December 24, April 15, June 16, and August 29 will be the four days in which the clock, uh, like noon, will be agree with the sun's noon, but only four times a year. The rest of the year, our clocks will be either 15, uh, minutes late or, or, or fast. Here we come back to how they see the stars. This is explains then the trochoidal path uh, explains how why they see the stars doing this. You see, uh, that is trochoid can look different because Proxima is below us, so it will be a flatter trochoid, but it's still a trochoid, okay? Uh, whereas Vega is above us, so we can see clearly the, the full chocolate in its uh, uh, length and height. But, you know, NASA here, if you can read this small type, they say, if you see this from NASA, this picture, or yeah, the looping action is the result of Earth's orbit around the sun. Well, why would that be? Why would this happen? Because we revolve around the sun. Are they saying that this long you know, stretch here is because our solar system is moving at uh, 800,000 kilometers an hour as, as they claim? Well, that would be absurd because then this, this wouldn't be three to one, it would be like thousand to one because the, this motion would be much, much, much longer than this, which would be probably what they mean is our <laughs> orbit around Earth, but it doesn't make sense. It, it just makes more sense in the Tychos. And here's the third thing that explains that the chokeweed 
famous chocolate explains, it's why st star parallaxes can be either positive or negative. And in the 18th century here, two Frenchmen competed to measure the parallax of Sirius, which is our brightest star in the sky. Well, they came to two completely different uh, results. Lacai uh, had the parallax at eight, eight arc seconds, and his colleague Lalande at minus 2.5. So you see, it's almost a, approximately a three to one ratio, but in the hope, he found it negative and he found it positive. So Lacai saw the, uh, this, the three one, the three part, and Lalande saw the, uh, the one part, but in the opposite direction. So here is very clearly explained why, why astronomers have been debating for ages about the problem that they couldn't, they, their observations of parallaxes didn't uh, agree with each other. And even as recently as in the 1960s, the four major observatories in America, uh, I read a long paper about it, they were all uh, debating of exactly this problem because all four of them had conflicting parallax data, data and they couldn't figure out why. Well, it's easy to understand now because it depends on when you decide to, to take a parallax measurement. If you take, if you measure, if you, you use this part A, I mean, from March to September, it will be one type of parallax. Or if you take, if you measure another star from, you know, in this green part B from August to December or from December to August, it will be Difference. You will see negative, positive, all kinds of different combinations, and that's what, why they were so confused. And and they still are. They still are. Hmm. They haven't never explained negative parallax to very, this day. Yeah, very. Don't let very, anyone the wise. Very interesting. And I I do want to unpack the stellar parallax a little bit further. But if I could jump in with yeah. a devil's devil's advocate type question here. So this mm -hmm. trochoidal motion of the man's yearly path or the bonfire's path, as you described it in your story, uh, is caused by the earth rotating on its axis while also moving along your PVP, proposed PVP orbit. Wouldn't we also yes. get the same trochoid if we're rotating on our axis and we're hurtling around the sun on the proposed Copernican or Kepler orbit wouldn't we be making maybe much faster trochoids but wouldn't we still be making little that's trochoids? what i was that's why uh, yes david uh that was, was trying to explain maybe uh, i went too fast there it would be absurd to think that it would be um One something uh, because if we are moving at eight hundred thousand kilometers an hour this part it would be extremely long. It wouldn't be three to one. It would be mm -hmm. like thousands to one. Yeah. Because one would be our rotation around the Earth, or our revolution around the Earth, according to heliocentrism. And three, the three would be, uh, you know, 800,000 kilometers an hour. You know, how much we would move in a year at that speed. So there, there wouldn't be a, this kind of trochoid. But this trochoid is, is also, you know, absolutely proportional to what we see uh, the stars doing. So uh, it, it matches the proportions. Yeah. So no, I just want to get, get this that. otherwise. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to get that out. So that it, makes, that and just, just one more time. Yeah, but I, one more time. It's really, you can, you can try that. You can take a CD, put it on your kitchen table mm -hmm. and you rotate your CD. But while you rotate it, you make it advance slowly from left to right. That's what ha what's happening here. And you put a dot on the, on the, on the side of the CD here. And you will see that this will happen, but you know you will have to be a bit patient. And this is actually what will happen. Anyone on mm -hmm. Earth will do this. Okay, of course, it will be different depending on where you are located on Earth. It will be much smaller if you are at North Pole, but it'll still be there if you are at the North Pole because the Earth is tilted by 23 degrees, 23.5 degrees. So you st will still have a little, a little uh, choke with if you are at the, on the North Pole. Because somebody said, uh, oh, well, you, then we can go to the North Pole and we just see a straight line. No, it, there will still be a chocolate if you're at the North Pole, I believe. Mm. So, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, and, uh, and, uh, I have, 
No, I'm... wait. Could we could we uh, uh, back up uh, a little, Simon? I I have some questions, yes. if if you sure. may. And I just want to add that uh, when you know when I I started to to familiarize my with the Tycos many years ago, and I I met Simon for the for the. Uh, I think it was the second time actually, and, and we talked about this. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really, it was really difficult for me to to understand this uh, man's yearly path, but but I do mm -hmm. now, and and it's it's very central to to understanding uh, um, the because it explains so many of the observations we see. It's it's a perfect mm -hmm. explanation for for why we can why there is uh, both uh, positive, negative parallax etc. Depending on on uh, when you measure uh, the parallax, mm -hmm. and it's and it's a combination of of the PVP orbits and Earth's um, rotation, as as you you display it here, and it. it I mean, once you get it, it's it's uh, it's not hard, but but it's 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 a bit hard to to um, conceptualize. But so I mean, if if the listeners or the viewers don't get this right away, don't worry, you study it and 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 you will understand it. But so, yes. but if we back up to to the beginning of your uh, presentation here with the with the binary stars, mm -hmm. I think that's that's. Uh, very interesting because when Tycho Brahe and Patani Samantha, when they devised their models, they and and I think that's that's a very strong uh, confirmation or implication of the of the Tycho's model that we have two independent uh, astronomers who came up with the with the same model, but at that and time probably... they they. Mm -hmm. At that mm -hmm. time, they Sorry. weren't aware of uh, uh, binary stars. I mean, the, mm -hmm. they, you know, no. you, you don't, you didn't have the equipment to observe uh, binary stars uh, back then. No. So, I mean, no. uh, as you have, as you have talked about, when talked about uh, Tycho Brahe, he he got a bit ridiculed about having uh, Mars yes. and, and the Sun in intersecting orbits like this. They said, mm. oh, why, why that, that mm. wouldn't work. They would crash. But what we've been able crash. to confirm uh, how, in hundreds of years of studies later, you know, when the binary stars were discovered and, and, and further started, is that this is what all binary stars have. They have intersecting orbits. Yes. So th that isn't uh, peculiar. That is normal. That that two uh, binary stars have intersecting it's orbits. Perfectly normal, and it's absolutely, as I said at the beginning, we can we can reasonably believe that all the stars are binary. I, I think we can say that now, at least ninety five. So we we will be part of the five percent of single stars. So that doesn't make much sense to me. Could you go anyway, back? Yeah, no, no, no. and and yes, if if we if we stay with the with mm -hmm. the binary stars, uh, Simon, mm -hmm. I think yes. what is also right uh, important to point out there or to understand is that it can be very mm -hmm. very hard to find or uh, or see a, a binary mm -hmm. companion. Because yes. a, a binary companion can be very weak. It, it can shine oh, very yes. little or not at all. And as one uh, astronomer that I, I talked about, uh, who talked about this, he said it's it's a bit like trying to, sometimes, you know, to, to find a binary companion or even uh, planets then, which which are even harder in in a in other star, star system. It's a bit like mm -hmm. trying to see. Uh, a mosquito in front of a headlight you know when you when you're looking at it <laughs> yes. with, with a telescope well i so, was actually and, getting and, that and that, and that yeah. could be the and that could be the reason also why not uh, all uh, uh, systems are confirmed binary because yes. th they may still be but it's just that it's so hard to to actually confirm they are binary and sometimes they do it by just seeing how the the primary star moves and they can conclude well it moves in a way it moves in a binary way so it should have 
a binary companion, even though uh, we cannot see it. Exactly. We can conclude exactly. that. And I was actually getting to, to this uh, question of the smallness of uh, the companion series B when it was discovered only in the 19th century, pretty late. Uh, it was a disaster for Newton. <laughs> With theory, they, they said, oh, this can't be. Uh, I think it was the astronomer royal at the time who said, uh, oh, we can't. This can't be true. This must be an illusion or something. But so, but then they had to find out, you know, why could this small small series B here could be the companion of such a big star as Sirius? And so what they came up with, it's just they just said that oh well, it must be very very dense. The the atoms must be very very tightly packed. So the series is very very heavy in fact, but it's as small the diameter is slightly smaller than Earth. But they say that the gravity is 400,000 times stronger on Series B than, than on Earth. That's how, how they try to justify this. But you know, Mars is identically smaller than the Sun. It's a 25 to 1 ratio in both cases. Is, would that be just a coincidence? We're talking about Sirius, the strongest star we have in the sky, the, the largest by far, the second uh, largest star, uh, you know, largest we can see, I mean, the, the, the angular diameter of, of, of Sirius is the biggest. Uh, the second one is almost half Sirius. So Sirius is a very, very important star. You, you, most people know that, I guess. So why, why would this be? Why would... And, why do people go around saying, oh, well, Simon, <clears throat> because I've heard some, we can explain the physics of Tychos, you know? Uh, what about Newton? Well, <clears throat> first of all, they explain this way that Sirius it's, can go around. And Sirius is very, very dim. They say it's extremely dim. Uh, it uh, should be, uh, I don't know if they say a red dwarf or a white dwarf, I think uh, a white dwarf, but you know, Mars could be a red dwarf, it's, it's red, you know, and, and the, the absolutely most common stars in the skies are, are red dwarfs, and many are invisible to the best telescopes, so you can see why we don't find all the, 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 the companions. Uh, now, this this is one of my favorite, actually, from um, from the book. When I found this, this this is a graphic from an old book, or not so not so old, actually. Uh, it's an astronomy book, which has finally they they showed exactly what Sirius does, uh, the big Sirius A does. Sirius A intersects Sirius B. It is much smaller, just like the sun's orbit is smaller than Mars's, Mars's orbit. But you can see all the analogies here. The only thing I put in here myself is the hypothetical Sirius C, which is very much debated. Some say they can't see it with the telescopes, but they are, <clears throat> many studies have been made and, and some uh, say that, yeah, that there must be a Sirius C in there. Well, I put it here. And if it's, if that's correct, this would be exactly very, very similar to our system. Uh, we, even, even the ratio, um, the seven to one ratio, which means uh, series B can get seven times further from the center here, which represents Earth, and or one, one to seven. And that's what we have in our system, one to seven. Mars can come uh, this close and this far. Now my, my graphic is cut here, but we can, this is what Mars does. It, it comes at 56 million kilometers sometimes, and sometimes at 400 million kilometers. So it's a seven to one ratio. So the, it, the similarities are incredible. So why would, would this, well, why would this Tychos be a strange system for, Astronomers, it should be absolutely, absolutely very much debatable because we have serious being like this. This is a serious system. It's identical to ours. 
and even the, the proportional diameters are identical. We don't know about series C how big it is, but they say they say it's larger than C, uh, than series B. It should be somewhat larger. Well, Earth is somewhat larger than Mars. Okay, that's yeah, very very interesting. And just to hit on something that Patrick said and something that you just said, we are proposing frameworks for observed data. That's what, and, and we can come back to that point later on, but when somebody says, well, the physics doesn't work out, the physics frameworks that we have are based on, you know, hypotheses that are borne out by data and they may be, there may be something else going on other than, you know, as you said, the discovery of Sirius B caused people at the time to say, wait a minute, are Newton's theories potentially yes. incorrect? There may be something else going on, but we find these observed measurements going on with the Sirius system. And the other thing I wanted to just make clear, if you could just go back one slide, Simon. Um, mm -hmm. It's a small point, but it was something I was rereading your Tycho's book. Am I correct in saying that your model proposes that Earth is not located exactly at the Berry Center, but that maybe our small PVP orbit is going around the, the point of the Berry Center? Is that what you found? Yes, or? yes. Well, uh, uh, further study is needed. I don't pretend to know exactly right, everything, right. you know, but. Um, Yes, it could be either you know, Earth itself and or the center of the PVP orbits. That's the, the actual barrier center of a system. Another thing is, oh, you, oh, that's good. You mentioned this. Mars always, when it comes closest, it comes exactly in the middle of the PVP orbit. And we should, we'll see about that later. But this is a very interesting thing. Um, yeah, it was actually on your, actually you had it on, you on a the, slide. On the, on the okay, yeah, you had it on an earlier slide too. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is a Tychosium, uh, the beautiful chocolate, yeah. uh, the, the, the spirographic motions of, uh, of Mars. And now I, I take off the traces. And what I wanted to show you is just that, um, you see Mars's orbit here? This is the center of the PVP orbit. You see it here? This is the center. This could be the very center. And right. it just so happens that Mars keeps passing here. When it comes closest to Earth, it keeps passing here, exactly in the middle of the 113 million kilometer um, the diameter of, of the PVP orbit is 113.2. And Mars passes at 56.6 usually when it gets closest uh, i found that much later when we had done the um, finished this uh, or almost finished the tycosium I, I didn't imagine this would be the case but it's amazing why would it pass exactly in the middle it, it tells you something i guess right yeah, so is this really, is what really we can, interesting. if you actually go forward i go forward now like see let's say you know, 10 years at, at the time, each step, you can see how the orbit here, I mean, just keep your eye on the center. You can see that Mars orbit actually revolves around this very center. See, I'm going forward 10 years by 10 years now. Look, if you could trace that, you'd see like the orbit would do a, an orbit around the very center of Mars's orbit. Which I think is is interesting too. If you do hundred years, it's, it's the same. You know, see, it always keeps in the neighborhoods of the center of that uh, great okay. that that great dot is is nothing. It's just the center of the PPP orbit. Okay. So <clears throat> now, if we should get back here. Uh, if you allow me to to go a bit further on these uh, you know slides because uh, I really want to yep for sure to uh, to, to, to test test them <laughs> so this is still Sorry. part of the broad <laughs> broad overview of, of the system 
Now, this is this is a speculation on my part, but uh, we'll see that you know many. This is not. I mean, I'm not the first one who who has uh, speculated that Sirius is the whole system of Sirius is our binary too. I mean, so it's a double but double binary. And mind you, we know of many double double binary systems in our skies. It's not something strange. Uh, there are many examples of. Uh, pair of stars on, on the left and a pair of stars on, on the right we can see them like that and we know that they are going around each other in intersecting orbits so this speculation of mine is if Sirius system is a double double and uh, a famous um, mat mathematical astronomer Jean Mayos uh, predicts that it, uh, we will have Sirius as our south pole star in about 60,000 years well, let's let me take this slowly now. This is our solar system today, and we have this South Pole star here. Okay. Now, imagine we go in sixty thousand years. We do this. I mean, this is not proportion. I don't pretend this is properly, you know, scaled or anything. It's just the the, the concept. So, if we move by sixty thousand kilometers here, and Sirius does this, this here in sixty thousand years, then exactly we will get Sirius as a solar South Pole star, whereas our current star is here. But you know, this line, the green line here is the same, shows the same direction. So that could, you know, that could be interesting. And why, why did, did I, you know, tilt them like this? Because what we actually see, and this is from another book, uh, this is what you see Sirius doing. It's kind of going downwards to the right in, in our skies. So, it's, and, and the solar system is reckoned to ascend the other way, northeast, we could, we could say, and here we could say southwest. So it all kind of, you know, it, it, add, it adds up. This speculation could have some, you know, merits. But it's all, only speculations for the moment. But I think, I really think now that as, as many other people have uh, conjectured that Sirius is our is our double double uh, companion. So we have, we are, Sirius is a double star. We are double, we are with Mars, we are a double star. But the two of them are joined together as well. It's not just speculation, yeah. Simon, because you, as you pointed out, Sirius does not appear to precess like to the other stars. Which, yes. you know, yes. as we've talked about other researchers have pointed oh, yes. that out and said- But the Binary Research Institute has, has yeah has done some excellent um, work on that. And uh, fortunately, they, they still think this, the Earth is going around the sun, but they have this very uh, compelling uh, papers about Sirius being our companion. Yes. So no, I'm not the first one to say that. No, right, if I may. Go ahead, keep going. Oh, you yeah, know, if we could stop, but I mean, I just maybe, uh, shortly, I would like to make uh, our listeners imagine one thing now. Angular diameter reality check. So, you know that our sun, which looks so big in the sky, is actually, if you, if you have an old vinyl record, and you, you hold it out, and you stretch out your arms, well, the sun will fit into the hole, <laughs> seven millimeter hole. That's how small the sun is, I mean, optically for us. All right. So if you, you know, you're sitting in front of a screen now, you'll see this. This is this is about you know seven millimeters to your eyesight, and this little dot, which is barely visible, is only sixteen times smaller than the than the big one, which I call the sun. So that's only sixteen times smaller, and Tycho Brahe, he was actually ridiculed for this later on. He estimated that Vega was 16 times smaller than the sun. Well, when you look at Vega, which is really strong, very bright star, it doesn't look so different than this, you know? But today's astronomers, on the other hand, consider the actual angular diameter of Vega to be 622,000 times smaller. I, have, I, I need to explain this. What they say is, yeah, we see the star, it looks pretty big and uh, we never see it, you know, but that's not the real size of the star. With the telescopes, we can 
resolve them to much, much smaller sizes because they need that theory or, or they need that because they're saying the stars are so incredibly far away. But uh, Tycho wouldn't have any of that. He, he said, I mean, they're saying that only the stars increase uh, in size as, they as their light passes through the atmosphere. But Jupiter and Saturn don't do that. Okay, they're not stars, but they're pretty bright. They, do not, they don't suffer any amplification of their sizes. But we have to believe that the stars suffer an incredible uh, amplification. That they look so much bigger than they actually are. So this is a big question for me, at least. I feel it's, it doesn't sound right to me. And what am, what am I saying in, in my book, of course, that the stars are about 42,633 times closer. And I'll explain that later. So here we have two star examples. The closest we have, Proxima, our nearmost star. So they say a latitude distance, 4.25 light years. Okay, so pretty close. Estimated size, one seventh of the sun. All right. Assumed luminosity. You know, luminosity is like, you know, a wattage, you know, like of a light bulb uh, kind of thing. 0 0.16 of the sun. Very, very, very dim. It's invisible to the naked eye. That's a close star. We can't see it. We need a very good telescope to see it. On the other hand, we have Deneb, which is the bright, one of the brightest stars in our sky. It's alleged to be at 2,600 light years away. Estimated size, okay, 200 times bigger than the sun. All right, so it's kind of bigger than the sun then. But then they say that the luminosity is 196,000 times of the sun. So that's how, why it's so strong, according to them, you know. I think this is another ad hoc assumption that uh, why would our sun be one and, and then it be 196,000 in, in, uh, in wattage? You know, why, why would it be? You know, what kind of incredibly strong atomic uh, uh, explosions would make a star so much brighter than our sun if it's, if it's atomic fusion or whatever it is? So, so they're claiming that this one of the brightest stars in the sky, Deneb, one of the brightest stars in the sky, should be 164 million times further away than the sun. So you, you remember this, the, the 16, this one, this, this dot is 16 times smaller, right? It's barely visible. Well, imagine this 164 million times smaller than this, uh, further away than the sun. All right, it's 200 times bigger, but 200 is much in this case. 200 seems like a big, but you know, we're talking about 160, 164 million times further away. So it does not make sense to me. I don't know about you, that the stars are so far away. All right. And what do we know now? Well, oh, you know, I just told you at the beginning of this um, talk, I told you that they found in 2016, a companion of Proxima. It took, some, it took them all those years until 2016 to find the companion. They don't call it the companion, mind you. They call it it's a planet or something that Proxima B, they call it now. But they, they're not sure if it's really uh, intersecting with, uh, but it could be like, you know, like uh, Pluto and, and, uh, and uh, Charon, you know, they, they discovered recently that they are revolving around each other. Uh, they call it the binary system now. They call Pluto and Charon a binary system. So, you know, there might be different types of binary systems in the sky and so on. So here is explain why I have come to this 42,633 factor of a reduction. I explain this here. It shouldn't be so complicated. How do they measure distances to the stars today? Okay, they do like this. They assume that we are moving in six months from here to here, from say in December to June, sideways in relation to any given star by 299 million kilometers, okay? Almost 300 million. So with, with the simple trigonometry, they say, okay, that star is so and so far away because they, they, they see how much it moves against the distant stars. But you see, if we don't move by 300 million kilometers, but instead, as the Tychus says, by only 7,018, 
kilometers every six months, then the stars would, would be much, much closer by this much, 42,633. I mean, I just went with that because it makes sense to the whole mathematical uh, geometry of, of the typos. And, you know, I might be wrong by this exact factor, but it has worked so far in many other calculations. So I'm, I'm sticking to this um, estimate of, uh, I call it the, the reduction factor. Of so let me, let, system. let me jump in there, Simon. This is, this is a yeah. great, great overview. Um, let me jump mm -hmm. in there because this is one of the points that's maybe hard for people to swallow at first because we've been so conditioned to the stars being so far away or so much yeah. you know so gigantic like you were explaining about deneb in in the swan and yeah. so it's not necessarily that hard for us to accept that those stars are enormous and very far away because we've been told that but what you're saying is there's so much evidence observable evidence that earth is not necessarily traveling at this hurtling speed around the sun and displacing mm. by this enormous distance around the sun. In fact, the observable evidence, there's lots of different categories, you've mentioned some of it, argues that that cannot actually be happening. And maybe we'll get into some more of those, like the, we'll get back to the stellar parallax and unpack that a little bit further. But yes. what you're yes. saying, let me, um, if you could just unshare for a second, or I'll just grab control, mm -hmm. let me... Sure. Um, let me see. Because I prepared a little slide there in preparation. Okay, it says, there. I'll just go back to one participant sharing at a time, and then I'll give it back to you mm -hmm. in a second. Let's, this is really intriguing. The part about this, I wasn't necessarily going to get into the stars being closer, but I did have somebody ask a question on our previous interview yeah. that, um, you know, could the stars really be so close? That seems problematic. Let me just show you what I prepared. A little slide. Um, uh, it looks like I'm already sharing. Can you see my screen? This was the Tycho's model, uh, not not the one. This yes. is the Ty Tycho's model, not not Tycho's with your additions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, right. let me get yeah. myself out of the way. We've got um, we got to get mm -hmm. our we got to get our faces out of the way just for a moment. And I thought this was really interesting. Uh, what is this doing in the middle of this? screen get that out of the way okay back to this um i think this might have been somebody that you mentioned thomas s kuhn he writes in the copernican revolution or maybe i just saw it on wikipedia but this is a book that was published in 1957 first of all it's interesting to note that when we have the earth going around the sun somehow in all those pictures the earth is constantly tilted in the exact same direction, even as we're hurtling around the sun, which is part yeah. of the model that is required if we're going around the sun to create the seasons instead of yeah, yeah. it keeps uh, proposes. Yeah. But um, leaving that aside, in this book on page 204, talking about this massive revolution in thought to go from everything that came before to a Copernican model, Thomas Kuhn writes, Omitting minor epicycles and eccentrics, which have no bearing on the harmonics of Copernicus's system, the Tychonic system is transformed to the Copernican simply by holding the sun fixed instead of the earth. The relative motions of the planets are the same in both systems, and the harmonics are therefore preserved. And he shows these two diagrams, and he says, you can explain what we see in the heavens by either the earth going around the sun or the sun going around the earth the motions are the same he says basically you could hold the earth still in the tycho's uh, in in tycho brahe's model or you can instead put your finger on the sun i've popped a little sun in the middle of the diagram and if we put our finger there and hold that still and then have the earth going around the sun you get the same motions, but down at the bottom of the page, or actually in the very next sentence, he says, mathematically, the only possible difference between the motions 
is the parallax motion of the stars, or he calls it the parallactic motion of the stars, because I wanted us to unpack a little bit more what is parallax, and you just showed a little bit of it. He says, mathematically, everything's the same, except the only thing we could say is, is going to be different will be the parallax motion of the stars, and that motion was eliminated at the start by expanding the stellar sphere until parallax <laughs> was imperceptible yeah. so we're gonna have to yeah. move mm. the stars yeah. way way out this is 1957 this yeah. this author is saying look there's no problem you can choose one or the other but you're mm. going to get some parallax differences but we'll get rid of that mm. problem by just moving the but, sphere but moving the far, stars far, very far, far away, away. Yeah. but what you're yeah. what you're showing is first of all we're going to have some problems with parallax and second of all um there's some problems with the observed data that show maybe Earth is not hurtling at this speed. Michelson-Morley experiment, we'll get into that. And also the trochoids, you know, that you were showing early, the, man, the man's yearly path would be a very different shape if we're hurtling at a much faster speed. So there's observable data. Everybody's trying to work with the observable data. Tycho and the... Um, Samantha, I think, uh, uh, Perron, uh, I forget how to say his name, but he came up using the observable data. They both came up with the same model, but you could instead hold the sun in the middle still and have the earth start hurtling around, hmm. but it just no, it starts to cause no, some you problems can't. with so, the data. Right, yeah, you, go, so go no. ahead. I just wanted to lead in with that. I'm, I'm sorry if I kind of interrupt you, but I know I want to very, very much emphasize that it's not true that the two systems are equivalent, that you just can put the sun or the earth in the middle. That is not true. That is a myth. And we have to dispel this myth right now. Great. I yeah, have, go ahead. I've, I've turned it I'm, mod I'm modestly, modestly speaking, too. sorry. I am the first one, I think, who have pointed out that it's not the case. And why? how have I done that? They're using Mars's, our close planet Mars, as an example of how that cannot do what it is observed to do and we shall see that in some slides later slides i have prepared that mars cannot align with the same star over a 546 per year, a day period it cannot do so in the copernican it is it is uh, any uh, any impossibility of perspective an optical mm. impossibility unless you right. okay even if you know, of course, the uh, you know big uh, big old astronomer who 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 doesn't like the Tychos will say, well, no, you do, those two lines are not parallel. They probably converge a little, and the star is so far away that we can't even see that. But no, it doesn't work because Mars is really close. We're not talking about stellar parallax here. Even we're talking about Mars, uh, Mars, which is close, which is like your finger in front of your nose. And you can test that at home, you know. If you have Mars uh, close, to, you have your, your finger, your, your index finger is Mars. And you move your head, and we'll see that on a slide, then you will see how much uh, the stars will move if your finger is close to your nose, and how little they move if your finger is further away from your nose. Right, right. So this is, part, this is time. real, yeah. this is real, real, real world uh, um, perspective, you can share, which is yeah. completely again if violated by the Copernican model. It is go, violated. Go yeah, and, and also if, if uh, uh, and Finish. I mean, uh, as you say, uh, Simon, there there is a, a, a problem with uh, saying that the Copernican uh, model and the and the Tycho's model are equivalent, uh, even if you expand uh, the celestial sp sphere, li like uh, they argue in this book. And also, if you ex, but I mean, if if we look away from that, those problems with the Mars, which we shouldn't, of course, <laughs> but just for a while. There is still such a big problem with having uh, expanding, uh, imagining that the the stars are so vastly far away, because the problem then is that they either have to be uh, absurdly large, huge. Uh, actually, every star needs uh, to be 
uh, as big as uh, um, the orbit of Earth around the sun. Every star doesn't only have to be bigger than the sun. They have to be as big as Earth's orbit around the sun, which is, is about 300 million kilometers. And this uh, Tycho Brahe uh, pointed out already in the, in the uh, 15th century when, when these models were in discussion. That, that's, that's a problem with the Copernican model. He liked the idea of uh, a rotating Earth, a, a diurnal or daily rotating Earth in his, in his private letters. Uh, but he didn't like the idea of a uh, idea of a uh, Earth uh, orbiting uh, the Sun. But this uh, this is what we are in now, and and astronomers they are uh, arguing this that we have uh, a, a, a very uh, uh, large uh, celestial sphere, and in various ways they also try to argue that. No, every, of course, every star cannot be uh, as uh, big as, as Earth's orbit, but we can still see them. And I just wanted, I, I sent um, a chat link to you. Uh, yeah, I see that, uh, right. Patrick. Yeah, uh, because yeah. I think this is so interesting because this is uh, kind of the first uh, mentioning of the Tycho's model in... Uh, in um, what you call mainstream uh, astronomy. It's actually the Vatican Observatory and, and uh, Mr. Can you, Christopher Graney. Can you share yeah, I can. I could share my it? screen. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, sure. Pull that up. So the first I think mention this is, of a this is, is so in interesting. Observatory. Uh, yeah. And uh, this uh, astronomer Christopher Graney, and he he, he uh, talks about uh, uh, Summer Shack and and the Tychos models, and he tries to explain why uh, Simon's um, arguments uh, isn't valid. But I mean, I think everyone should read this uh, if if you are interested in this question. Could we actually see the stars and 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 uh, uh, I mean, what you presented now, Simon, with a with a uh, angular, uh, what's it called? I, I, I'm losing the words here. Well, the uh, angular but, diameter. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The angular di diameter, because if we have uh, the celestial, the size of the celestial sphere that's argued, we would not be able to see uh, the stars. Mm. That 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 is what makes sense to me. But Mr. Grain here, mm. he argues well, for various reasons, we we would still be able to see them. So this is um, uh, this yes, is it's a problem. An interesting uh -huh. article, yeah. but yeah, but uh, not he didn't really convince me. <laughs> Um, because no, uh, no. <laughs> we 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 are told the stars are so incredibly far away that. And that the angular diameters, the real ones, the actual ones, are extremely small, like microscopic. Uh, Sirius, which is the biggest star, is considered to be the real angular diameter is 0 0.006 arc seconds, which is, I mean, the human eye can only see something that's 60 arc seconds. I think that's the limit, or 50. And mm. so how can Sirius be such a bright star if, if its real diameter is, uh, you know, thousands of times smaller in actuality and the rest is just, you know, the glare that forms when the light passes through our atmosphere? Because that's what they're saying, basically. Mm. It's the, you know, the airy disk, the famous airy disk that George Airy came up with. So, yeah, yeah they are holding on to that idea, but I think it's very, uh, it's not very credible. And I showed you the example of um, uh, Deneb, which is supposed to be 2,600 light years away. But there are, there are apparently stars that are 10,000 light years away, visible to the naked eye. There are a few of them. I, I, I've been finding some of them. Uh, like absolutely unimaginable uh, distances. And, and we can still see them, where, whereas we can't see Proxima out of a near more star with an egg rice. So the, the, the proportions are absolutely massively wrong in my mind. The, the, it's, it's unbelievable. That's, 
Hmm. I'm sorry if I feel. I mean, so no, 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 that's very good. So we'll put a link to that article. So strongly about we'll, it. we'll put a link to that article. And did you want to um, get into stellar parallax because we haven't really yeah. explained exactly what it is? Sure. I, I know it's, absolutely. It's, I'm uh, already go ahead. with my slides. Yes. Yep. Okay, so I'll share my screen again. Okay. All right. So uh, yes, we were. Here. You see my screen now. Hello? Yes, yes, yeah, we see it. Okay, okay. So we saw how they measured, they are measuring stars this way. Now, the the question of parallax is absolutely critical um, because what are they actually saying? What, what, do they, what, what data do they have in catalogs? They have like the... Uh, the Tycho catalog, they call it, funny enough, it's called the Tycho catalog of, of stellar parallaxes. And there are 2 million stars listed there. And uh, what an, an Italian astronomer found out a few years ago was that uh, the distribution of the stars in that catalog are 25% are negative, 29 are positive, and the rest almost 50% is they, they don't find any parallax at all. So 50% of the stars that they have measured, they find no parallax at all. Yeah. Well, yep. here, Simon, can I just this... interrupt and ha have you explain for our, <laughs> for yeah. I'm probably sure. in your, your good uh, Scandinavian schools, you learn about parallax, but I bet you there's a lot of, uh, I, I think I went through my entire 12 years of schooling mm -hmm. plus four years of under uh, of undergrad plus some graduate work without ever hearing anyone explain to me the word parallax in a formal way so could mm -hmm. you just tell everyone what parallax is and then continue okay but yes yes parallax is very simply <clears throat> what happens uh, um, you can see parallax by just closing one eye you know you you, you and the other alternating and and if you look at the you know like a flagpole in front of you the flagpole will seem to move in relation to the background just by closing one eye and the other you know it's very evident so that's parallax the optical effect of parallax because if we see something with our right eye or, or left eye it's things start start moving so when they measure Stellar parallax, they usually uh, measure a nearby star. If you see my mouse here, there is a nearby star here. So they, they, they take a picture of it uh, one day and then they wait for six months and take another picture of it. So they think we have moved by, as I said, 300 million kilometers. So it, it becomes, you know, like a triangle here. And it's called trigonometry, gives you the opportunity to, to then to then gauge how far that object is and right, it, it's right. used on, on the ground as well it's, it's used in you know in uh, when you make roads and stuff people know how to measure parallax right but or like with two stars, trees in a forest if there was a far away tree and a closer tree yeah. and you started to move left and right with yeah. your head or with an instrument you would see the the nearer tree would right. seem to move farther so that's what we're doing with the stars yeah it's not moving but it's an optical effect right so the problem with uh, measuring stars is that they think we are moving by 300 million kilometers, which it makes a very large baseline. So then that, that makes the calculations very, very, uh, that the stars are very distant, the ones they, they are, want to measure, these closer stars. Because they use a distant stars like a, you know, like a wall, which they don't move much at all. So they can use them as a background, the distant stars. Uh, and, and so they can gauge these more closer stars, how far they are. But so back to what they are finding is that 50% almost have no parallax. So they must be incredibly far away. You know, we move by 10 million kilometers, but no parallax. Okay. Well, in the Tychus, this is very easily explained. Let me start with zero parallax. We won't see any parallax of a star towards which we are moving, because we are moving straight to us, or a star we are going away from, because this is, this is what the Earth does in the Tychos. It slowly goes at 1.6 kilometers an hour, or mile mile per hour, it goes from here to here, okay? It's like 
thousand years to do just to stretch a little piece here. So we are kind of moving in a straight line, which means that we can see stars moving in one direction on one side of the Earth and on the other direction on the other side of the Earth, which is not possible in the heliocentric model, because then when we, when we look out during the night, we can always look out in, from the same window, as I call it. I did example, the car going around, you know, <laughs> the sun, and you know, we can only see the stars in the right-hand window. So they will always move in a, cert in a certain direction and cannot move in the other because stars don't suddenly change direction. But is observed is that they move in two different directions. So that's positive and negative parallax. And that is, this is a mystery that they're still debating about. Even in the latest uh, ESA and NASA papers, they are trying to understand how are we going to handle these negative parallaxes, you know? Uh, or they could talk, they're talking about truncation. You know, they are truncating, they are removing them from the, from the statistical, statistical data because they don't want them. <laughs> you know? They say there must be error. There must be, there must be all error. So why wouldn't the positive parallaxes be, be uh, erroneous if the negative ones are? So it's very, it, it's it's comical almost, you know, how they are debating. It's a very they don't know what to do point. with it's the a negative very parallax. powerful point. They don't know. So let me just yeah. rephrase it for for <laughs> listeners and see if I'm saying it right. So if mm -hmm. I'm in a in a car, like you said, and I'm driving along a very long road, maybe I'm in the middle of Norway or Sweden, and there's trees all around, fir trees, yeah. Christmas trees, pine trees. The, yeah. the, as I look out the window to the forest, the closer trees will seem to move further than the background trees. But yeah. if I'm going towards trees, there, if there's a bunch of trees straight ahead on the road, there won't be any parallax mm -hmm. because I'm going towards them. No. Same as out no. there. And in the Copernican model, my road is actually going in a big circle around the sun. So I should never yeah. see any trees, i.e. stars, on the inside window. The, the window that's facing the, the inside of the circle, I should never see any trees because I'm facing the sun. So I'm only going to measure parallax out the window of the outside of the circle, which means the parallax of trees should always go the same way. And yet, as you just pointed out in this picture half mm. of the parallax that they measure seems to be going out the left window half the parallax that they measure seems to be going out the right window and fully half meaning the front and back windows has no parallax at all which is what you would expect if the Tycho system is correct and not what you'd expect if Copernican system is correct and so they just throw out all the measurements of trees on the inside window and say that must be an error trees can't possibly be going mm. that direction in their parallax. Am I saying that yes. right? Yes, but you know, uh, on my forum, the Tycho's forum, there was a guy who rightly pointed out that uh, if we go around the sun, we are going once in one direction in relation to some stars, and then we go the other direction. Yes, but so I wrote a new definition of negative parallax for him. You know, I, that would, I would like to see in the dictionaries. Negative parallax. Uh, when a star appears to move in a direction which is conflicting with the, um, the, uh, the, the, the supposed motion of, of Earth around the sun. When it conflicts, when it goes one way or the other, that's negative parallax. I mean, there is only one direction that a star can move, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, in, in relation to the other stars, and that, that is what's, the what's parallax, yeah. yeah. Negative parallax has to be defined better, yeah. uh, because, because it really is you know, hard to wrap your hand, head around such things, you know, the spatial mm. <laughs> optics. But, but, it's, but I mean, it's, all astronomers... Once you've done that, you'll, it will be clear. Yeah. All but I mean, yeah, all, all astronomers, astronomers they... Uh, all astronomers ahead, uh, agree that you we cannot have uh, negative parallax. 
I mean, that's 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 an agreement. We because if we have negative parallax, then uh, the Copernican yes. model isn't isn't valid. So what they do yeah. is try to find ways to explain away the negative parallax, and they are saying either mm -hmm. well it's a measuring error, or they say it's a proper motion of the star. So. Could, yeah. could we yeah. go into that? What, what is proper motion? Yeah, the stars, so they do have proper motion. So they, they just move very slightly, but uh, very slightly they move every year to one direction or any kind of direction, X, Y, Z. Uh, yeah, so they, so yes, they're saying this motions, isn't but... actual, they're saying this isn't actual parallax. It's because, I mean, they, they, they agree that, that uh, stars yeah. move in an orbit. And they say yes. that the motion we have observed of this star, it's not actual parallax. It's, it's the stars. It's a star moving in an in its orbit. So it's and there, so they say we yeah. have seen a motion of the star, but, it, but it's an actual motion that the star do. So it isn't actual uh, negative parallax. So we write mm -hmm. off uh, negative parallax or uh, as either meshing errors or proper motion but they never yeah. or very very seldom do that when it comes to positive parallax because they well, like positive it, parallax because that doesn't yeah. conflict with the copernican system right yeah yes but they can't get away with that excuse because over, no, of in, course uh, not, over the I, centuries yes. over the centuries we know in which direction each star it has proper motion so that is something that is given that they 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 are calculating in their parallax measurements they know i mean we know that stars move they all move a little bit you know but always in the same direction move to the right to the left up or down okay like i, I showed you serious it's, it's going downwards in our sky and to the right okay. all stars have proper motion but we know this proper motion we we can include them in in any any you know, big observatories, they know that and, and, they, and they're going to account for it. So they can't get away with saying, oh, oh, you saw a stellar parallax. Oh, maybe that's because the star moved to the left. Oh, no, that star is always moving to the right. See what I mean? Yeah, no, it's very so they powerful. they can't get I away think... with that. It's not an, a valid excuse. They I can't get away with it. Stellar parallax is hard to, as you said, kind of wrap your head around at first but i really believe this is one of the strong this has to be one of the strongest pieces of, of this is one of the yes i believe this is one of the strongest uh, things in the book but uh, yeah but let me then um, let me then uh, proceed because I, i'm going to talk more about <laughs> the first man who discovered parallax is called Bessel. okay now where's my oh Oops, okay. Bessel was a very famous astronomer who is said to have um, measured for the first time a stellar parallax because it was very difficult. For many, many years, they couldn't find any stellar parallax. So they were all panicking. But finally, Bessel found a parallax of star Cygni. Okay. Can I get this? Oh, yeah. Right. You see star Cygni down here? It's, it's, it's yep. supposed to be... Yeah, you know, like 21 or eight, it's supposed to be down here somewhere, okay? Uh, in relation to how Earth moves in the Tychus, which is from left to right here, okay? <clears throat> so, you know what? What I found in an old book that uh, it was, they, they said that unfortunately, after many attempts, Bessel discovered that his first attempts yielded negative parallax. So he had to continue, and finally he also found positive, which he, what he was looking for. Negative, he, 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 they say in the book, this, they must have been observational errors, mistakes by Bessel. But Bessel, and that's a very recent discovery made because they found a 2020 paper written two years ago, a very scientific paper who talks about the first, the first attempts to measure stellar parallax. So, they, of course, uh, explain in detail what Bessel saw, and I've, I've reduced it in a few words here. But basically, what they say 
is that between March and July, he observed positive parallax. Well, that's the green part here. So he, this would be deemed as positive because here the astronomer is moving as expected in the heliocentric model to, in relation to the star. But then he saw between August here, when now is here, between August and then to March, he saw negative parallax. And he said, well, well, well. and he finally discarded them. He said, all my negative paralyses, I'm not going to talk about them or whatever. He, 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 he became famous because he found the first parallax of Cygnus. Okay. But it, this is, it corresponds perfectly to what I've predicted for several years now. I've been, you know, looking at this for <laughs> untold hours, you know, and to get familiar with with why the negative parallax would happen. Well, in this case, it's because of the trochoidal motion that the astronomer does. Because here he will see positive of this star, and then he will start going backwards and then going here. So this will be negative parallax. The star will move unexpectedly um, in relation to what the heliocentric astronomer expects, you see? And this is even harder to explain here now. I, I should stand in front of you and show it, but I can assure you that it makes sense that uh, this part of, of the year will yield a negative parallax for this star. And this part of the year will yield positive. So this is a very recent um, graphic of mine. And I'm pretty sure it's, it's, the, it's the explanation for this uh, adventure, this misadventure of Bessel, which is ex ex explained in detail, it's, it's described in detail. Yes, but there were uh, problems he, for, for a while, for a period of the year, he, he kept seeing negative parallax. And then the article just goes on and doesn't explain it, you know, but he, they don't really do much about it. He maybe all, all of these months that he saw negative parallax were all errors, but they just happened to be corresponding to what is expected in the typos. So from that's, March that's to July, or from yep. August to March. Could I just anticipate okay. an objection here? And again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate just to allow you to answer potential mm -hmm. objections. I love it. Would, yes. On that red part, which is the negative parallax that, that you've discovered, and I'm assuming he would see the negative parallax on the left side of the loop. On the right side of the loop, it would still be mostly positive. But, but the objection is, would he even be able to see Signe at all when he's on that side of the earth, obviously earth is in the way. He's, he's facing- Yes, yes, oh, well, okay, okay, yes, but good question, good question. Well, this is when uh, you, you have to understand that <clears throat> if, he, if, we ch if he would choose a long period, like from August to March, he would be able to take one here and one here. But then you see, uh, August, March, <laughs> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't move much, you know, from August to March, it would be almost a straight line. And he would be totally surprised by this. There's so many ways of explaining it. It's it's it's, it's tricky to, as I say, to wrap your head around it. But um, I've been doing that, and uh, I can assure you that uh, this is what this would be a very big surprise for him. And yes, I understand your question. Sometimes will be the, the star will be between the sun and us. Okay. It will, but there are <laughs> ways of circumventing that by looking at certain moments, you know, and, and taking longer periods. So astronomers try, to, they try to look for as, for as many dates in a year as possible at, at, when I do these uh, uh, observations. So, yeah, no, that's, understand, that's, well, that's, maybe that's, here, yeah. Maybe in December he couldn't. Maybe in December, then he would not have been able. In December he would have had to pause, you know, his, his observations because the sun would have been in between the star and him. Yeah, yeah. but I guess so, yeah. for for my my simplistic metaphor of driving down the long road in Scandinavia yeah. with trees, <laughs> what this shows is that actually the parallax is not just 
positive out one window and negative out the other window because it's not simply a car driving straight. It's a car that's rotating on its axis. So sometimes a star that's out the right side window will have both positive and negative on the right side because of the the man's yearly path on the trochoid. Am, Am I saying... Yes, as I said, we had a, a really um, good debate on my forum uh, a few weeks ago with a Swede, I think, a Swedish um, uh, member of the forum, and he rightly said those things, and he, he he told me a few things that you know needed to be explained better in my book about this um, you know paradox negative, and he was right. It, so it, it's about explaining it well, you know, uh, in words uh, how. Um, why negative parallax can be called negative and, and, and vice versa. Right. Uh, and so like said, he, he, it was a very fruitful negative. debate we had. Yeah. No, I think parallax yeah. is really important. I don't, I don't think we need to spend too much time on parallax unless there's more oh. that you or Patrick wanted to unpack about parallax. Otherwise, maybe we could get into retrograde. Yes, that's the next Christmas present I wanted to explore. Retrograde motion. Because is it true that Copernican model explains retrogrades as a sort of parallax oh yes 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 i mean here is the official explanation for why mars periodically reverses course you know in the sky it it actually goes backwards for a while Mm -hmm. for uh, up to 70 days or actually up to 80 days between 40 and 80 days it will go backwards Uh, so they explain like this Okay, we are going around this the sun, okay, they say. And so is Mars, okay. So we are going around the sun, and when we overtake Mars on the inside lane, this will happen. So it's just an optical illusion. Because uh, we are going faster than Mars, so Mars will appear to, to do like this. You see the lines they've done here? This is the official yeah. explanation for why why we see this. Uh, all right. the planets go backwards for a while. All the planets around us. And well, fair enough. Uh, I used to like this. I believed in that for many years. You know, oh, yeah, it sounds pretty you know, sensible. But no, it is not. Uh, if you think about it very well, and I show you why I can prove it's impossible. And that is because... You know that remember Mars comes very close to Earth sometimes, and sometimes very far, even though it's still in a position. I mean, it's it's uh, it can get uh, as close as fifty six. Well, maybe the next uh, slide shows it. No, wait. Oh yes, here, here, the down here. Look here, first. Um, in two thousand three, here. Mars came only 56 million kilometers from the million kilometers from Earth, and in 2012, eight years later, it was as far as 101 million kilometers. Okay, much further, almost and double. Those are accepted distances. That you're showing it on a Tychosian model, but those are accepted uh, different distances. What and I, model are you I accept them. I explain why very shortly. I accept them too because I accept the distances that they have calculated for our planets. But not for red stars, because the stars have been they've been used the baseline of 300 million kilometers. But for our planets, they've said that it it's been sufficient to use the baseline of the diameter of Earth, which is only 12,700 kilometers. And and I think we know that pretty well that it's that Earth is that's big or that small. <laughs> so <clears throat> I accept these numbers so but you know we we see uh, when we when it came close in 2003 it was very big you know <laughs> it was mars was really really strong and it was much fainter in 2012. um so this is accepted but n- now here comes the problem here comes the problem what is observed is that when mars is closest in 2003 was exceptionally close then it, its retrograde is much shorter, much thinner, and lasts for less time. And the opposite, uh, uh, when it is further away, it is much longer. 
the retrograde lasts for a long time and it's wider. You see here what I've done? Show it this. Right. Well, we can we is, can see that in photographs is, that you that you've shown elsewhere in your book too. It, that that actually is yeah. observable. Right. So now we go up to this thing that you can test at home in your in, in the comfort of your own home. This is the index finger test I talked about earlier. Now you you stretch your arm out towards your library and you move your head from left to right, you will see that very few books will move in relation, you know, the parallax will be small when your finger is far away, when you have your outstretched arm. Then now you, you put your finger much closer to your nose and do the same thing, and you will see that many more books will move in relation to your finger. The background will move much more. Well, this is, this is the exact opposite of what we see with Mars. Follow me? Right. This so when exact, Mars is closer, exact it opposite. should have a much... If, if this is just a phenomenon of parallax, when we're passing Mars on the inside loop of the track and Mars is closer, we should have yeah. a much bigger uh, observed <laughs> retrograde for Mars than when you can, we're uh, passing and it's you, farther away. You can think of it this way. Imagine you are in a, a very big Indianapolis racetrack, okay? very, very, very wide Indianapolis racetrack. And you're overtaking a, a car on the inside lane. Huh? You're overtaking it. But there, there's another car further up on the other side of the large racetrack. Well, the, the closest car will seem to move against the, the spectator backdrop much more than the further car. Do you agree? <laughs> it, yeah, once we just, it, we just in the moment where you, you pass it, yeah. it, it will, you will see a much bigger section of the public behind than in the case of the, the car, which is in the fifth lane down there. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, could you just show the photographs of the of Mars's um, retrograde in those two years? I know you have it in the book. I don't know if you have it handy. I can, I can bring it up <sighs> if not, or maybe t uh, Patrick can, because well, the here actual... is the retrogrades of Venus and Mars. You know, yeah. okay, they are they are similar. The retrograde periods of Venus and Mercury, and these are interesting, because something that I didn't really emphasize in the book, but I done here with this yellow type. The average period of Mercury's retrograde is exactly one sixth of a year, one sixteenth of a year. And the average retrograde period of Venus of, of Venus is one eighth. And I'm saying that Venus and Mercury are the moons of the sun. Well, they are very much, you know, they're tuned to you know, a ratio from two, two to one ratio. Their, 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 their retrogrades are tuned at one eighth and one sixteenth. Um, so here is a retrograde of, Merc of uh, Venus, and here's a retrograde of Mercury. <clears throat> and um, this is how what you will see when you learn to use the Tychosium. You will see these these loops, these uh, trochoids, actually, uh, spirographic motions of the stars, and they are real motions. They the stars do this. <laughs> And that's the maybe the biggest difficulty to to accept maybe for people used to you know the the elegant uh, heliocentric uh, model with the with the sun in the middle. <clears throat> but I show you shortly one 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 pretty cool thing that I uh, want to show you here with the entire system. <laughs> now we're looking at the entire system, including all the way to Neptune. Okay, all right. You see it? Yeah, yeah. Can you make it a little bit? Can you make your Tychosium window a little more uh, bigger in your screen? Can you? You've got bigger it, on my screen. Yeah, like can uh, you maximize that window that has the Tychosium so we it's, can see it? Uh, it's at it's at the maximum now to show Neptune. See, it's, I it's, mean uh, the it's window, the window that it's in. Zoomed can out, you, but. The window that it's in. Oh, 
Uh, it's all open for me. Uh, okay. All right. That's okay. I, I can if, zoom in. If you uh, press, I, can... uh, I think it's F11 uh, or F12, you can make it full screen. That's without, what I was, uh, yeah, that's what I was sure. saying. To make the Tyco zoom that's full cool. screen or bigger. I can also zoom in uh, when I... Uh, Okay. <clears throat> now I just want to press show F11 uh, or F12 on your keyboard. No, no, not. Uh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Don't worry about it, Simon. Go ahead. No, and don't worry. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. I only, I only wanted to show you the, the, the dance, the beautiful dance that the whole system does. You know, for a while. Oh, this is too fast. Uh, I want to do it one year. One year. Okay. So. If you see the whole system, what it does, they, it's actually <laughs> like a hula hoop dance, right? Every, they all are synchronized because it, they weren't this nicely synchronized at the beginning of our, uh, when we were building the tech costume, they were all kind of moving in crazy ways because they were not correctly uh, uh, placed, the planets. But now it's doing this kind of beautiful dance. And, and it's like, and it looks, what it does it look like? It looks like some, you know, electric coil. I mean, we certainly have an electric solar system, I think, electromagnetic. So I just wanted to show you this, how, how, how beautiful it is, really. It and is beautiful. So, and, it's, and so you're saying that the retrogrades are the, actual. The, as the sun is dragging, they are actually, they they're are actually, actually making put some uh, trace on. If I open the trace, I can put the trace on, uh, you know, Mars, here, Mars. Uh, I put the trace on here. Dang. Now yeah, I have I think... traces on, uh, on, on various, you know. Yeah, we, we are getting a pretty low you, you, uh, frame rate, at least in my end. But uh, I encourage everyone okay. who watched this video, just go in for and, and uh, um, play yeah. around with the uh, Tycosium uh, yourself. It's it's completely free. So you can, you can <laughs> yes. see and, and um, yes. play around with it. There aren't any good instructions for it yet, but I, I should make a video about that actually and, and show everyone no, yeah. how it works. But yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, going I forward. think the, just to before we get to the moons of Venus and Mercury, before we leave mm -hmm. that retrograde uh, Christmas present as we're unwrapping the retrograde, I think the important yeah. thing is that if the the retrograde motions by themselves cannot be explained by the Copernican theory satisfactorily, because we've got the the, the various periods of Mars, which we talked about a little bit last time. And, and I think I've, you know, I made yeah, a whole video see that about it now. Yeah. And, and so the point is the retrograde motions are much better explained by this trochoidal epitrochoidal motion in the heavens. That's that, that you're showing with your model then the Copernican model has some major problems with retrograde motions is basically and they are exact, David. They are exact in the sense that I showed you some are thinner and some are larger. You know, so you can go to the Tychosium and see in what day did, did the Mars change direction, you know, as of the astronomical tables that have been gathered for hundreds of years. Was it exactly 3rd of April that it changed direction? And you go to the Tychosium and yes, it does hmm. in that exact date. So to, th to imagine, and, and all the planets change direction in, in the time that they were observed in reality. I've, 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 you know, I've been going through so many tables. I have a, a, a huge amount of tables, which I've, I'm, I'm checking with to see if it all checks out. And it's always been checking out until now. I mean, uh, I've, I've checked so many things. I've, I've checked even the, the actual... Um, conjunctions with the planets with each other and they've matched uh, when they match they they check out with uh, tables that uh, can be can be found and and verified so the the tech person i just want to do this parenthesis will ask oh well because it's very nice but does it really is it is it um, precise is it accurate 
Yes, it is. It even shows the correct distances of each planet at any time. And the marginal error, there is, of course, some error here and there, but it's very, very small now. We, I've just been you know, refining it and, and it, it's, it's, it's turning out very well. And it's, it's remarkable. And of course, comparing it to the Delarium, which is apparently the most uh, performant uh, simulator, and it, it all matches very well. I, I've been testing the Venus transits across the disk of the sun, which are very rare, but you then must have the Venus rights, okay? It can't get pass mm. above or uh, below the sun. It must and also, exactly uh, if I may, Simon. The same with the Mercury's uh, transits. Sorry? Yeah, if I may. Uh, yes. Also, uh, as you pointed out before, when <laughs> when uh, um, uh, David uh, uh, showed that that book from the fifties that argued that yeah. uh, the Copernican model and the <laughs> and the, um, uh, Tycho's model that he discussed that mm -hmm. they are equivalent, but only uh, with the difference that. Uh, the Copernican model has a much uh, bigger celestial sphere. Uh, you objected mm. against that uh, statement, and and it isn't correct. Uh, and and what uh, very much proves that uh, are the the retrogrades and, and the the, mm. the parallax problems uh, you get mm. if. if because it it it's, it isn't a, a, a correct statement, and if you like, I could demonstrate in in Tychosium yes. later on what kind of physics that is required for uh, the Copernican model to be correct. Because in the Tychosium, you can place uh, the sun in the center, but for the retrogrades to appear to us as they do in the sky, the Mars retrograde and the Venus retrogrades. Uh, I the think stars... you covered that in the first podcast. Yeah, if I may finish, if I may finish, mm -hmm. thank you. So, sure. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the stars, what, what is required for the Copernican model to be geometrically correct is that the stars move together with earth yes. around the sun yeah. in a year mm -hmm. so actually uh, for for the copernican model to be uh, uh, correct we would have a very peculiar kind of geocentrism and that is that uh, the the entire celestial <laughs> sphere follows earth around its journey uh, uh, around the sun so uh, I, I can show that if you like. Uh, yes. It's a bit tricky. You have to switch on the stars and, and stuff. But it, but it, but it's yeah, it's actually yeah. comical. But but it, it's it is. true. It's it what is. is required. So yeah. Yeah, I think the retrograde. So we should we should um, we should look at that. I'm concerned about yeah. the size of the file. So maybe if. Um, okay. Why don't I actually stop this meeting so that I can preserve this mm -hmm. um, that we've already done, mm -hmm. and then we'll start another one. I'll send you guys a new link. I'll send you both a new link. It'll take until this one has um, saved before I can generate another link, which might be up to five or ten minutes. But all right, if you don't mind, we'll take a break here. We've unpacked up through the retrogrades, and we're getting now into the the moons of. Um, the importance of yep. Venus and Mercury as the moon. So let me go ahead and end right now. So, uh, Patrick, if you want to prepare that yep. retrograde uh, demo, we'll do that um, and then we'll roll into part two. All right. We're back and we are just finishing as we are unwrapping the presence under the tree. We're just finishing unwrapping the present of the retrograde motions. Uh, after which I wanted to get into either Mercury and Venus as moons or Michelson Morley, whichever of those two presents you want to start with. But uh, mm -hmm. before we leave the retrogrades, let's just completely unwrap that present before we jump to any of the other presents under the tree. Um, Simon, you said there was a few more things you wanted to mention about why retrograde is so important 
and why the Copernican retrograde uh, explanation has some real problems. Yes, well, more than uh, the retrograde, it still has to do with Mars aligning with the stars. And, and uh, so I should share my screen, maybe show you the, the relevant graphics. Yes, go ahead. Let's uh, see. You should be able to share. I'll make sure. Yeah, I've, I've uh, pressed no. all the buttons. Try try one more time now. Okay, now yes, it works. Okay. There it is. So we are on this uh, topic here, and this topic is something that the Maya astronomers knew. Uh, what the the long term motions of Mars? If you so, let's start like this. If you're going to if you're a patient astronomer and, and you want to see how long Mars employs to get back facing the same star, you will see that every time you, you have to wait 707 days, usually. Seven times 707 days. And the Mar and Mars, you see here Earth, Mars will return facing the same star you chose. But the eighth time, so one times out of eight, it will only employ 546 days and, and and why why is that you know how could that be in the copernican system we are just mars is revolving around us and doing nothing strange they should be always the same periods but no the actual sequence is seven times 707 days and the eighth time is 546 so in a copernican simulator as i show here this is a copernican simulator this is what they show that this about this 546 days period the shorter one and the maya astronomers call this uh, i mean they, they they call it in a, in, in a paper that describes the maya and uh, maya's knowledge about the mars motions they call this the, the, the short esi the short empirical sidereal interval and and they talk about it in that, in that paper. It's uh, you know, a Western paper talking about Maya and you know, knowledge, but they don't explain it. But you see, to, for this to happen, Mars would, would be, I mean, it, it's shown on the, on the Copernican simulators. Mars will be, on, we will have moved in um, 546 days is one and a half years. Okay, so once and a, one and a half, and, and we will end up here. And Mars will be here, but the, the, the same star will still align as 546 days earlier. And, uh, you know, we've moved by 300 million kilometers, and this, these two lines are parallel. I mean, you can see pixel by pixel, they are parallel in the, in the simulators, in those Copernican simulators. Now, so, could I just break in real quick, um, Simon? Yep. So, I know we've covered this a little bit before yep. in the last time, but it's such an important point that it um, it is and, 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 and Copernican and it's to be shown. Yeah, the Copernican theorists really have no explanation. I wonder if they even try. But when I'm looking at these two mm. two side by side pictures, if mm. I'm playing devil's advocate, could I not maybe say, well, that that um, Copernican simulator you're using this the solar system scope simulator maybe it's just wrong if you move mars along its track you know about half halfway across the circle to where it's above the sun then the line from earth to mars would be pointing you see what i'm saying well, if I, you see yeah go ahead. no well you see the, the simulators always tell you exactly what yeah. um at what the right ascension it is. And, and this particular star that, that I chose for the, the demonstration, it's called Denebal Jedi, and it's located at 21 hours, 47 minutes. And here it is at 21.47, and here it is 21.47. So, you know, at least from Earth to Mars, it's exactly on the same um, uh, longitude, right? Got it. So that, so that, that, can't say that. It, can't be, it can't be that the angle is different. It can't be, no, but you know, what is marvelous about the Tychosium, you know, when when Patrick did the Tychosium, I was of course very nervous. That hopefully, this will happen because I was I had calculated in, with pen and paper, you know, in my mind almost that it would happen like this, and it did. When the Tychosium started turning, 
I did this. This was the first thing I checked. You know, I was very nervous. And indeed, on this day zero, I call it day zero. Okay, you start. You see Mars in front of Dene Belgeri in this case. Given star is Dene Belgeri. And after exactly 546 days, it will come back here. So on the same line of sight, we say straight line, on the same latitude, 21.47. <laughs> okay? And it does that. Why? It does seven times 707. And, you know, I, I test that as well, of course. Here it is. Here is my full test. I tested the whole sequence of eight passages of Mars in front of that star, seven of them occur in 707 days, approximately, 708 or 706, but you know, more or less 707. And the eighth one <laughs> in only 546, which I have highlighted here, only 546 days. This one from, uh, from this day to this day is only 546 days. But you see, this is Mars, 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 all on the same line all the time. Yeah, well, it's, would, it's would this be an incredible it's, coincidence that the Tychosum shows this? No, the Tychosum is showing the truth. The Tychosum is showing what is observed. Now, and Simon, this is I, not possible to do in a Copernican simulator. Could I ask one this more time? Works. It's, it, it's not yeah. possible. Do they try to explain it at all? Is there any attempted explanation for why we would have seven of the long uh, ESI? You know, we've been discussing with some... Patrick and I have been discussing with some astronomers, uh, you know, uh, conventional or uh, mainstream astronomers, and we haven't gotten any any rational answer. To be to be to be honest, we, we there was this Swedish veteran astronomer who tried to explain that uh, it's always that the stars are so far away, so the, the, the three hundred million kilometers is nothing. It's just a, a blip, you know, it's nothing. 300 million kilometers of lateral displacement will not be noticed. That's basically what they say. But then they would have to say that your Tychosium simulator does this by chance. I think that's a harder question to, to tackle. You know, would, would I've used, uh, you know, the speed of Mars in Tychosium is a constant. It's simply the average speed between the, the maximum and minimum that Kepler says that Mars, you know, Mars accelerates and decelerates. So what I've taken is the average speed for all the planets. And it has worked perfectly. For Venus, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, the average speed is used and it's a constant speed. Now, this is what turns out. We get Mars facing the same star as it does in all these eight on all those eight dates. So, uh, you know, you can say what you will that, uh, yeah, it still works in the Copernican, but this, <laughs> this works perfectly. It, it, they are ex almost exactly at 2147, all, the, all of this. 2147 is where Al Jedi is. So you, you can, you know, you either say it's coincidence or, or, or nothing. You can't say any, anything else. So, Okay, now, so this is the, the very, very important question of the long ESI of 707 days and the short ESI of 546 days. No one talks about it so much in the, in the astronomy literature. I just happened to find this paper of a group of um, kind of alternative astronomers that were interested in the Maya knowledge of astronomy. And they were talking about this. You know, the Maya knew about this. It was strange. Well, you know, and they do, uh, it's a very, very scientific paper. I mean, when I say scientific, I mean serious, okay? Well, well presented and, uh, you know, proper abstract and everything. So it's a very scientific paper, but they don't explain the problem. They don't make anything out of it. You know, how come Mars does, has two different uh, intervals as it lines up with the star? It's not explained, it's just, presented that, well, in my ears, in my knew this, and, <laughs> you know, no, no more. So I think that's enough for showing uh, these alignments of Mars. They work in the Tychos perfectly. They really work. And um, I go back now, if you want, to the Christmas present of the moon. Yeah, before we do moon. that, if I, I may, mean, uh, let's, let's have Patrick show that. Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, because uh, I think that this is an excellent... Uh, 
opportunity to show uh, show this because oh, yeah. it it really shows the problem here with with the uh, parallaxes. Mm. Oh, so yeah. I'll I'll yes. share my screen here. Share all. Okay, so here now we got Patrick's screen. Perfect. Great. Perfect. I see it, Patrick, and it's got a pretty yeah. good frame rate too. Great. Very yeah. Nice. So here yeah. we have uh, um, the solar system according to the Tycho's model. Uh, we have the sun, the Earth in the center, and uh, Sun moving around. And here we have Mars and doing its its uh, beautiful trace and uh, retrogrades, retrogrades. But <clears throat> I have added the ability to to change uh, center. Here. Yeah, before you do that, so, Patrick, could you just let it let yeah. it run for a second, just so people can observe these retrogrades? Um, yeah, sure. Because, we can uh, yeah, just, do it uh, a little bit so, like the chefs go. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. <laughs> the Mars Mars is is following a circular orbit around the sun. It's not. Yes. Its orbit is not trochoidal. Its orbit is circular, but the sun. So it's doing a circle. It pushes and it the around sun is like doing this. A yeah. Circle. Yeah, it's like it drags it. Yeah. And so as we watch, even though Mars is tracing a circle, it's actually making these trochoidal loops in the sky. And that's what creates retrogrades, which are so yeah. um, distinctive, visible from Earth. Anyone who knows astrology follows retrogrades. All the different planets do retrogrades. And right now, in fact, we're in a retrograde of Venus. Right as we're recording this, Venus is at its closest. Uh, it's right in front of the sun, Kazemi in front of the sun on its on its loop, passing right in front of the sun. It's doing a retro. We'll talk about Venus and Mercury in a moment when we get to that. But this is so critical. And you've created this Tychosium, Patrick, that like I said last time, the Antikythera mechanism, which is so marvelous, from antiquity, it showed retrogrades. It was trying to be able to predict retrogrades and it did it pretty well, but this does it almost perfectly. Um, and it's in, in alignment with all the other measurements that the Copernican models are using as well. It's not that you've changed any measurements, it's just- No, no, and I, I just would like to add there that we we actually don't know uh, precisely how the uh, uh, antiquity mechanism uh, was constructed uh, because it's it's rusted away, so they couldn't recreate it. But what they have tried to do when they have uh, tried to recreate the antiquity mechanism is that they have set the the sun as the base because they think in heliocentric terms and, and, and Copernican. Uh, but that makes the, it very problematic for the Antikythera mechanism to, to be correct. You need so many cogwheels and it becomes very complicated. But, uh, and, and Simon has worked on this and, and uh, uh, speculated that what if uh, the moon and the earth is the central cogwheel in the mechanism that would make it much easier to to do a correct model that that shows retrogrades and uh, and things like that and and that is also the thing with with tycosium it's it's very simple it, it isn't that it, it's um, it's circular motion in uniform speed it's just circles that hang on to circles it's not that <laughs> So th that makes it more more likely that that the uh, Antikythera mechanism was a functional device. If if you if you just imagine you can build it in a in a different way. So yeah. Well, it's remarkable, and this is just a. I just want to emphasize what an achievement this is that the Tycosium itself. So um, so I interrupted you just so that everyone could really grasp. What we are arguing here with this model is causing the retrogrades. And we even see Jupiter out there and it's doing a circle, but it's also, we saw it do a retrograde a little, uh, 
as it yeah. comes around it's getting dragged around it's it's following the sun on a circular motion but because the sun is also doing a circle it is creating those retrograde loops for jupiter out there as well there it's doing it right now see it yeah I, I thought about that before actually david one way to explain uh, the tycho's model you could say that the solar system is a system that moves around the earth because i mean you you I mean, one way to you can explain the the Tycho's model, or and also the the earlier Tychonian model. It's uh, the sun moves around the Earth while the other planets are moving around the sun, and 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 the consequence of that is what we see. We see retrograde motion, but that's that's just an effect of the fact that the planets are orbiting the sun while the sun is orbiting uh, the earth i mean that that's what you see here with 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 mars that mars is slowly orbiting uh, the sun or or they together but while it's doing that the sun is also moving around the earth yeah that, it, that's what we see these retrograde effects and so just to to finish off you know that that broad introduction that we were doing this the earth is stuck in the berry center or or swirling and on in the berry center of this dance but i i really liked there was a quote from simon in chapter 11 that i really liked i even put it on a slide but since you're sharing i won't show it right now but simon says mm -hmm. isn't this serene situation enjoyed by our planet rather reminiscent of a ship so earth is like a ship gently circling around the calm zone in the eye of a tropical cyclone or the eye of a hurricane so we're we're swirling mm -hmm. kind of quietly in the center mm -hmm. of this while the spinning storm rages around it moving in the opposite direction of the ship so every the whole like you said patrick the whole mm -hmm. the whole solar system is like a cyclone or a hurricane <laughs> and mm. we're stuck in the eye of the hurricane going in the opposite direction in a slow, serene circle. And it, when you're looking at the Tychosium and reading that quote, it really um, makes sense that, well, maybe that's the situation that you need for sustainable life because everywhere else, mm. atmospheres mm, are yeah. uh, harder to keep pinned onto your planet. I don't know. Yeah, it was some poetic imagery there, but maybe... It's a bit more than that. So it, it maybe, but yeah, we, we. I think we're talking about you know electromagnetic system, and these are magnets, and they. That's why they keep. Yeah, it's like they were all attached with strings to the sun, you know. So if they were attached with strings like yo-yos, they would do this. They, they, they wouldn't go in circles. They would do chocolates, and uh, simple as that. And I guess a quick a quick word about the, uh, the Antikythera, which you men mentioned. There is a guy in Australia. You can find his uh, website is called ClickSpring. He's an amazing guy who's done a reconstruction reconstruction of the Antikythera, and he has actually discovered a new thing um, that the old experts, I mean the older veterans of the Antikythera studies, they are, have always said that the frontal uh, ring of the uh, the this machine so that would be like the Egyptian year, but no, he has been looking closer and f found out that they are actually thirty fifty four holes, which is the moon's cycle. So and he has presented a paper together with others to the horological the British Horological Society. And they published that paper. And so there is much controversy going on now, I think, between these different uh, Antikythera experts. Uh, because I, I did my the test myself. I took a part of that ring, which is broken. So you only have a part of the ring. I took a 59 part, a, 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 a little cir a half circle, of, which had 59 dots. And I multiplied it by six, right? And that makes 354. Uh, and I, I, I mounted it, you know, on my uh, graphic um, uh, program, and it it adds up to 354. So it, it's a whole new 
uh, discovery that this guy in Australia has done and, and very, very important research for as I'm concerned because I really think that the moon is, is the most important object in our, in our skies. Our, our moon is, is a central drive shaft, as I will show you later. You're right. We'll get to that. So just to finish off on the retrogrades, Patrick, you're going to show us um, one more reason yes. why that Copernican model yeah. has huge problems. Um, yep. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So here we have uh, the motions in, in the Tychosium according to the Tycho's model. But you, uh, I've also added here, you can change the frame of reference. So here now we have, uh, we are looking at the Barry center. This is the center, uh, but we can change this. So we set the sun as the center. So let's do that. And now we see uh, how the earth is moving around the sun and Mars is, do, is doing its retrogrades. <clears throat> In reference so so and I, I mean this is the argument uh, they have and that was in that 50s book that well you can you can set the sun as reference and, and uh, it will still work but the problem comes with the retrogrades and how the actually how the planets move in front of the stars because we can uh, add the stars here And so if I zoom out here, I've just made a, a, a celestial uh, sphere. I haven't put in actual distances and, and we, can, uh, we can put on the, the um, uh, constellations as well here. Very so nice now we have constellations. Patrick yeah, Green. exactly. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the good ones. <laughs> so, but what you see here now, if we, if we increase the speed, is that uh, now you see so now the entire celestial sphere is moving together with earth when it moves uh, around the sun and this is what is required if we are going to see what we confirmably see in the skies when, when, when Mars are moving and the other planets are moving in front of the stars and doing their retrogrades. Yeah. So, so I mean, you, you could, uh, I'm, and, and I know this, this is, of course, absurd, but, but this, is, this is actually what is required for, for Copernicanism and heliocentrism, a, a very strange form of heliocentrism <laughs> where the entire uh, universe moves uh, around the sun together with the earth. A very so, strange form of geocentrism, you, you may yeah, say. Yeah, sorry, very strange form yeah. of geocentrism. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Just so, so just so I can understand, let me just pretend like I'm uh, trying to poke holes in what you just said. But Patrick, you just created this um, Tychosium, mm -hmm. and so you've got the stars moving, but that doesn't prove anything. That just shows your um, your computer program does this. Can you just yeah, yeah. explain <laughs> explain what explain what I'm missing there? Because we're holding yeah, the sun, I... we're holding the sun still, and having the Earth mm -hmm. go around the sun. And why does that require the whole globe of the heavens? To it requires, uh, and let me take this, um, David. It requires this because otherwise it wouldn't match what is observed. Uh, you see, the stars uh, have been observed for hundreds of years, and and uh, and the planets too, and they sometimes align. But the the computer is intelligent. It knows that we want to see the planets align with the stars on a day. And if we have the sun as uh, as, as uh, we have now uh, in the middle, it requires the stars to swivel as well. So Otherwise, basically, they're the, the following data, the Earth because the Earth's the going around the sun. Yeah, <laughs> the Earth's the going around the sun. Observational data to the right of the screen here. Uh, you can show the position. Uh, tables here uh, Patrick the positions this data would be wrong if you open the positions we see these things moving okay all the time they would not match reality if 
the stars will do this. You know? Okay, but what <laughs> if we just imagine that those stars get pushed out infinitely, you know, <laughs> extremely far because on the model you've had to make them look a little closer. Well, that, that's what they mm -hmm. do. That's what they imagine. They yes, <laughs> let's imagine it again. Yeah, but they've been imagining it for years. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick. But, uh, it doesn't what's work the, for me. <laughs> what's, what's your uh, What's your counter to that, Patrick? If I just say, "Oh, well, this is because we have to move them infinitely farther away." Yes. Yeah, it's 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 still the same because, but uh, they would have to move. Uh, a little as as you you see here i i this is this is a celestial sphere and and you can enlarge it and and make it smaller at will uh, so if i enlarge it you still have to have this that that uh, the entire celestial sphere uh, moves uh, together with with earth around and this is also the reason let me switch back to to um uh, the barrier center here, I get a, a little bit dizzy. So, and, and this is also the reason why you will never find the stars actually uh, plotted out in a, in a Copernican orrery, like JS orrery, or uh, there are a few. You will never see the, you, you could never actually see well now mars is in front of this star well if i look uh, at this from a bird's eye view in an orrery so could i draw a line here you you will never have the stars in an orrery because right. it doesn't work it doesn't work geometrically they can't put them there they can have we can have a, a, a geocentric view like in in stellarium and right. and uh, the planets move on this on the sky in a two-dimensional way, but you can't make it a three D model out of it. It's not possible because um, it won't work. It's a very important point. So, it's a very important point. I mean, you've shown it yeah. already with some of Simon's uh, demonstrations, where he was lining up uh, Dena Balgetti in the tail of the goat Capricorn. You were showing well when Mars is here and when Mars is here, and they don't put in Dena Balgetti. They just show this is where we think mars and earth are exactly model, exactly and you exactly. you're putting it in and showing that well this is yeah. a problem unless those lines they're exactly. they don't they're not really parallel they're billions of miles long and they eventually intersect and no but and just remember what i showed the dene belgeri which is at 21 hour 47 minutes exactly it can be there when we are on either side of our supposed orbit around the sun so what is even the meaning of having uh, the the our celestial sphere divided in 24 hours you know and in minutes and seconds when 2147 can be either here or on the other side of the orbit what, what it, it really is is absurd well I'm really, say... i mean even how how is how, how our astronomers how they can work with that i can't even save... imagine how how they can work with that i'm going to save the question for the one of the last presents to unwrap is I mean, it just mm. seems like those orreries then are being less honest than Tychosium. In other words, it's it begs the question of is somebody deliberately obfuscating as opposed to just doing their best um, to present a model that they actually believe? Because the fact that they never present the stars and that the stars pose a king size problem for the alignments in the in the set in the syn synodic uh, periods of the planets shows that th they have a king size problem anyway um mm. we'll save that question may, may i just uh, yeah, add one thing david while, while um, because i I've, I've um uh, had a friend over here yesterday who who uh, wanted to look at this and we talked about this this model and and it's i think it's so interesting uh, to bring up what comes into people's mind when they look at um, uh, feasibility or if it's reasonable. And one, one thing he said, I, I find it very strange that such big planets uh, like Jupiter and, and Saturn, as we see here, uh, that they follow the sun, you know, when it moves around the earth, that they, they, they move in, in uh, circles like this. It's, it's, it becomes, uh, you know, pretty violent 
kind of you can i mean it's uh, because uh, jupiter and and uh, mars they they do retrogrades uh, as well uh, but uh, i mean yeah it 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 can appear a bit strange that these big planets uh, follow the sun like this when it orbits the earth uh, but as uh, Simon has shown very well uh, with with the the Tycho's model. This is the most reasonable conclusion of how our solar system is configured when everything is put together. When we look at at uh, parallaxes, retrogrades, everything, and put it together, then this is what we uh, arrive at. And and. Uh, as you pointed out, David, this um, uh, has not this is not uh, has not been in discussion for several hundred years now. You know the the configuration of the solar system, but I, I really think it's it's a question that really needs uh, to be addressed again because of all the observations that have stacked up now for, for hundreds of years and, and, and they don't match uh, heliocentric model. They don't. So that's right. Yeah. It's the, the, you know, this, this was a question that occupied the minds of, you know, some of the most brilliant thinkers for centuries, trying to explain the retrogrades, trying to understand how, what framework do we use to explain what we see and we've been handed this framework i use a um, a metaphor of like an ice cube tray we have all this data and it's like the slippery liquid that uh, water we're going to pour into an ice cube tray to make it to make sense of it but that's mm. our framework and they've tried different ice cube trays down through the centuries and then all of a sudden we basically stopped with the Ke Kepler gave us this ice cube tray and for whatever reason you know he threw out as you point out both Tycho of Tuga Brach and Longamontanus his more trusted assistant was skipped over and Kepler was given the was suddenly elevated and Kepler's ice cube tray was announced to be the winner and every other ice cube tray was thrown out but it may be that our that the data mm -hmm. just do not fit into the ice cube tray that we've been using but we've just stopped no we can't question we've got to keep fitting things into this tray even though they don't really fit yeah yeah and and yeah. and and the, and the objection about well wait a minute these large bodies jupiter saturn that looks pretty violent for them to continue following the sun that's based on a framework we've accepted, well, gravity is the main thing at work here. There may be, mm. as you point out, magnets behave this way, electromagnets. There may be something electrical, magnetic. Those forces may all be related. The, the point is that um, if, we, <laughs> if we just stick with Newtonian physics, we still have a king size problem because now these objects in the sky that don't have jet propulsion on them are speeding up and slowing down and and doing all kinds of anomalous things that we're supposed to accept uh, there's some there you know the, if you read the book you'll see wait a minute they're they're saying that the moon speeds down and slows up uh, speeds up slows down mercury einstein was called in to try and tackle the why is mercury doing these incredible speed changes of up to 30% faster and slower as if it's driving it First 100 miles an hour, then 130, then down to 70. It just, well, how do you well, explain Einstein that with didn't question, Einstein didn't question that. He, he, he was trying, he did, um, his role was to explain a very, very little discrepancy that they found that they call the anomalous precession of Mercury. And it was like 0.43 arc seconds uh, too much or too little uh, every uh, century. And in my book, I think it's the very shortest debunking of Einstein ever done, I think. Uh, it's about that, you know. This 0 0.43 is given by the fact that we do not revolve around 
Mercury, but Mercury revolves around us, uh, around the sun. But so, and that means that one, one revolution, uh, you know, it gets, um, it's taken away from, uh, from Earth in, in 100 years, and, and that's 0 0.43. Because that's the, that's the actual uh, small percentage of which it will uh, lose if um, if 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 uh, we are going around Mercury. So it's just you know a question of relativity. <laughs> yeah, it's relative. You know, are we going around Mercury or, or is it the other way around? But no one, no one even realized that it was very simple calculations I made there. And and it, it is um, it is explained now the, the anomalous precession of Mercury is, is just a wrong math count because of the op the uh, opposed uh, you know geo and heliocentric uh, geometry. Mm. That's all. That's fascinating. Nothing so, more than that. So that that's fascinating. So I think this might actually be a good time if if you don't object to bringing in Michelson Morley because again um i will do so i will yeah, do so why don't we why don't uh, we explain what that is because that that seems yeah. to be yet another piece of data that shows the copernican slash kepler ice cube tray framework yeah. uh, continues to have problems with real data that um <laughs> that, that don't add up that, that it can't fit into the tray uh, yeah, I will do so now, uh, if you like. Uh, it's at the end of my um, slideshow here, but I can take it now. And it's uh, about the various interferometer experiments, which Michael Simoli is one of the most famous, but uh, Data Miller was much more, uh, much more patient. He spent uh, all his life doing interferometer experiments. But there's something that I never told even you, gentlemen, so shall I share my screen and, and... yes, if you uh, give it a try, I may have to push some. Yeah, it looks like it's working. Good. Yep. All right. Go ahead. So uh, it's um, down here. So let's see. Uh, slide thirty-five. Slide thirty-five. Yes, it's it's this. Yeah, I explained it very very briefly here on this uh, slide. It's just you know, you know when you when you do presentations, <laughs> you need to shorten everything. So this is just to say that what is okay the zero point eight kilometer an hour speed variation factor is something that detectors talks about in the book in various places what is that that is what should be expected if um, let's say now we have um, okay the earth's moving at 1.6 kilometers an hour in this direction and you want to see if the moon changes speed you know as you look at it for a long while well you will you want it would be the moon will be Changing speed here in relation to us plus plus one six kilometers an hour because we're going in the opposite direction. And on the other side it will be minus. But here will be minus eight, here will be zero, zero. So if you add up this, the average oscillation, the average variation factor will be zero point eight kilometers an hour. Okay. I think that's uh, could I just interrupt and just ask? A, could I just interrupt and ask a question that somebody may be thinking? Doesn't the moon get dragged along with the Earth, so it wouldn't? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. No, but we're talking about the speed variation, observed okay. variation, because in relation to the stars, you know, uh, yeah. we are moving in relation to the stars, right. but yep. and the moon is moving around us. But yep. there must be also some some little effect happening because we are moving from left to right all the time at 1.6 <clears throat> but what i'm saying here is that we're not supposed to see a 1.6 average the average would be 0 0.8 half that because of this mathematical right. thing mm -hmm. which i think is sound maths okay <clears throat> so this is what will be expected in uh, 
you know, if you if you take many many observations on the moon, you will come up with zero point eight. So, what did Dayton Miller? What was his results? In all his years, he he spent many many years um, trying to. What he was looking for this well, the speed of Earth, you know, which should be one hundred seven thousand kilometers an hour. Well, he saw nothing that fast, but his average number was 9.5 kilometers a second. If we just divide this 9.5 kilometers a second by my reduction factor, <clears throat> you remember that, 42,633, we get 0.802, okay? So he's assuming thing. that the stars are much farther away. So you, yes, so he came yes. up with a much faster pace. Yes. And now, but that's not all. There were three separate other interferometer experiments. The Michelson Morley, famous one, one, one of the one of the Michelson Morley's experiments, uh, the Roy Thorndike experiment, and the Esclangon. All three were looking. They they detected a diurnal a daily variation of the speed of light okay how they did that is you can read it's it's very complicated and very sophisticated machinery okay but they they, they came and this is something that i found um this is not you, something you find easily in the literature because it was it was pointed out by maurice Allais, who who was a real, really strong debunker of Einstein's relativity. Maurice Salet was a Nobel Prize in economics, but he was also an astronomer and an expert statistician. And he showed that um, Dayton Miller's uh, results were very, very reliable. They were consistent. And then he tells us about these three experiments that came to the, almost the same number. And the number of... Um, it's like a 0 0.0000075 something, you know, uh, percent of the uh, of the speed of light, and that adds up to, by my little pocket calculator, to 0 0.809. So these three also confirms this little theory of mine. I think that's you know, that's four different experiments made by a very very famous, eminent, and competent uh, scientists. It could be all, you know, coincidence, okay? But that's what it is. I can show you the maths. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't write, show you all the maths here uh, on this occasion, but it's, um, most of it is in the book. Maybe this last one is not explained completely because I found it recently. But anyway, the 0 0.8 thing is, is, has been found. But they didn't know what to do with it, you know. They they couldn't understand it. They all said, "Well, yeah, we saw some little variation, but they they had no idea what it was." And sure enough, Dayton Miller's experiments were ignored. You know, it, 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 his whole lifetime was no, no. He must have seen something. He must have done some temp. He had he had some temperature problems. He, you know, he was attacked by some. Einstein uh, fans, uh, you know, heavyweight Einstein fans, and he said, they said that Dayton Miller had didn't know what he was doing, basically. But Maurice Saleh showed that he was actually very, very competent. And so, of course, these other were competent people. They so knew what I, they were doing, but they didn't know what they found. What they what they found. You see? So Simon, so when I, I was I was asking about the Michelson Morley, just because uh, I. You've gotten a little more detailed than uh, um, what I was thinking. If I could just step back, like the big picture was they were um, operating under the Kepler model, assuming that we're going around the sun. And so therefore, yes. the Earth must be traveling at a certain speed to make it all the way around the sun in a year. And so they were do they set up a experiment in the 1890s and used interferometers and maybe you or Patrick can explain if we need to, but basically they were trying to measure, well, we must be moving really fast. And at that Do time, the they, they believed in ether. So they said, well, we can figure out our speed through the ether. And then they yes. found what well, we're almost not moving at all. 
and the way you read it about it on Wikipedia or, or in mm. kind of textbooks would be, well, that's because, mm. of course, there is no ether. But what about the other problem? They also didn't measure that we're moving very fast. So right. no, no, first, first of all, because I don't, I, I, I must interrupt you. I'm sorry, because you're saying something which they didn't find anything. They did find something. They because in in the textbooks you will always say they see um, that Michelson Morley they found they were had null results. That's a lie. That's not true. If you look a little bit deeper, they found something close to nine point five ten, just like Dayton Miller. Mm. But since it was much smaller than thirty, which was the expected speed thirty kilometers, they discarded it as error or problems with temperature or stupid things like that. It's mm. it's hilarious to read. I mean, it's actually outrageous that they don't teach that to astronomy students. Most will say, no, they got null results. So that's that's because and Einstein explained it. There is no ether. <laughs> Einstein came with a solution. There is no ether, so we can't measure the speed of, of Earth. The problem was that they couldn't measure the speed of Earth because we are not going around the sun at 107,000 kilometers an hour, 90 times the speed of sound. That's crazy to think that a, a beautiful place like I'm sitting here in a garden with uh, lots of cicadas and birds, and, and, and we're going at, at 90 times the speed of sound right now. No, the sun can do that. It's a you know, ball of fire, at least. Uh, it can go that fast. But the Earth, no. The Earth has life on it, it's oceans, life, uh, tranquility. So that's why I'm confident that it should sound more logical that Earth is going slowly, for instance. It's, it, it's more logical also to think that we are in a binary system since all the stars around are a star binary. I say all the stars now. I hate to keep repeating 90% maybe. I think all the stars are binary. I, I just want to, to say that because yeah. we will find, I'm sure we'll find out in, in 10 years or 20 years that all are binary. So in that case, you know, we must be binary too. Mars must be the companion. So Simon, yeah, I'm to, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, maybe to, to stick at this uh, uh, discussion about uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe we should, maybe it's easier to, to follow the, the reasoning and the argumentation if we talk about a little what, what an uh, interferometer experiment is. Uh, yes. And it, it, it works like this that <clears throat> you have a a ray of light and then you separate the, the the light with a half mirror and you send it in different directions and then you you join these uh, light rays again and you measure uh, if you have any uh, change in polarization of the light and if you have that then you can confirm that these light rays were traveling at different speeds and before uh, the early uh, 20th century and before Einstein uh, uh, light was only regarded to be a, a wave propagation through a medium and this medium was the ether so the reasoning with the with the Michelson Morley experiment was that or with the inter interferon Inter I can't say that word. Interferometer. Interferometer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, the reasoning with that experiment was that if we could uh, measure uh, polarization shifts here, then then the light waves had moved at different speeds. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, designed a very clever experiment to confirm Earth's speed uh, around the sun which is about 107,000 kilometers per hour. According to them. But when yeah. they did the experiment, they, they couldn't confirm uh, this speed uh, according to how, how they, what, what they were expected. They wanted experimental an experimental confirmation of Earth's motion around the sun, but they didn't found, find it. But as you pointed out, Simon, they did find 
some uh, difference in the speed of these light rays, but it was much too small to be uh, to be a confirmation of, of Earth's motion around the sun. And what has happened, and that, that's pretty absurd, is that instead of, you know, oh, we, we, we can't confirm this speed. Maybe, maybe Earth is moving much slower because, I mean, we do find a little, a little speed. We can measure a little speed. No, no, no. Instead of that, we have, sh sh physics have changed. So, and, and, and the, and what you always hear a physicist or astronomer argue when you talk mm. about the Michelson-Morley experiment is that the Michelson-Morley experiment gave a null result because yeah. that is what is required with the new physics they have invented. Because in the new physics, light isn't a wave propagating through a medium. No, 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 we have no ether. Light is actually made up of small particles. And these are very peculiar particles because they they can change the the flow of time even because yeah it's 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 complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's it's, long, it's, it's or... Einsteinian or it's quantum physics and and mm -hmm. it's and and the, the the annoying part with quantum physics is also that they actually don't have experimental confirmation on what they argue. It's mathematical um reasoning and mathematics is a language and 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 you can say true things in a language and you can say false things in a language mm -hmm. but the only way to actually confirm things is to do it experimentally but they they don't do that they just say this this is the way it is so it's it's very peculiar how physics have changed to not conflict with the heliocentric model instead of yes, yes. adjusting the problems they have found when doing this uh, these experiments so yeah that's a very significant yeah. point so uh, thank you for unpacking michelson morley and i'll refer listeners to check out all the details in that particular chapter of the book unless there's anything else we need to unpack on michelson morley i suggest we move on to the next thing unless there's any other Michelson. Morley I have, uh, yeah, I have one ahead. thing to we have follow this up, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, following up this on this. Yes. Enable sharing too. So if you need to share any screen. So have you got, am I sharing my yeah, screen? Yeah, I, I gave it back. I just oh. turned it off so that we could see Patrick right. while I explained. Go yes, ahead. perfect. Perfect. No, it's the, this next thing, which this is all about, you know, speeds confirming the, the Tycho's speeds. Uh, the speed of Earth, I mean, basically, and it's it's about the solar apex and anti-apex, which many people may never heard about. But what it is, what the what the Paris Observatory says, it's um, the sun is said to be moving towards the solar apex and away from the solar anti-apex at a speed I'm of. I'm sorry, 19... Simon, your your screen isn't showing. If you if uh... oh. All right. Uh, yeah, it was hidden. Oh dear. Yeah. I, All right. Michael. Apex and my, my apex. No worries. No worries. So um, we, the solar apex and antapex is said to be. They say that you know they look at the the, the all the stars and they see there is a. There is an average speed we have in relation to the stars. And many, many people, many researchers have come with, to this 19.4 uh, kilometers a second. That should be the speed that our solar system does uh, in relation to this, our stars. Okay, And thus moving by 4 AU a year. AU is you know, the astronomical unit. Right, the distance right. from Earth to Sun is a AU. One AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. Yes, so four AU is you know four times one hundred forty nine point six million kilometers. Uh, one hundred forty nine million kilometers by four. 
349.6 million. So um, in the Tigers, 19.4 kilometers a second corresponds to to exactly 1.6, not 0 0.8 now, but we're talking about the actual speed of Earth, so it's double 0 0.8, 1.6. You remember 0 0.8 from the the other uh, from researchers the that came yeah. up? Yeah. yeah. Oh, from uh, the and, uh, in, like interference, Somali, yeah. Dayton Miller experiments. And moreover, 4 AU corresponds to if we again do use the, um, the Tychus reduction factor 42,633. It, it is exactly 14,036. What's that? That's our EAM, that's the Earth, Earth's annual motion. Earth moves every year in the Tychus by 14,036 kilometers. So what they are seeing is, according to this, is the actual motion of the Earth of 1.6 kilometers an hour. And, and uh, so <clears throat> you see here, this is, this is taken from the Tychosome. So we are, they say we're moving away from the antiapics. Yes, we are doing that in the Tychosome. We're moving from here to here. <clears throat> in 12,000 years, we will be here to, uh, under Vega, which is considered the solar apex. So we, we are actually moving as they say, okay? <clears throat> now, in the summer solstice, we are facing Sirius, Sirius, the star Sirius. And at the summer solstice this year, we will be, well, we do actually have Vega above us, but you know, the direction will be the opposite one. So this will be the secular motion of the whole system. Half a great year is 12,672 years. We'll be on the other side. The sun, the sun does, does this, look at this. Uh, we, this can be generated in the Tychosium. You can see that the sun will do this um, its own its own spirograph. Okay, the sun will do this in, in many many years. All this to say that um, the official the officially agreed upon speed, if you just reduce it by the, 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 my reduction factor, which is calculated in other ways you know because of the how they, they measure the distance to the stars it also matches these other values that they have come to and this this is very much accepted this should be the uh, what they call it the, the the average speed in relation to the local standard of rest you know, this should be our speed in, uh, in relation to the the most the average speeds of all the stars, frankly. Well, there's another thing about the stars, and that's that comes from Jacobus Captain. Sorry, Jacobus Captain was in his time the biggest authority in star stellar statistics. He was a statistician. He looked at all the stars. And they say of him that he, he he was a man without a telescope, but all the observatories of the world were his because he had you know he was in touch with he he, he had uh, there was as many as uh, four hundred observatories which collaborated on a huge project he had to determine how the stars were moving in relation to us, basically. And what he concluded at the end of his long career. Is this uh, is this covering? Oh yeah. Is this covering my? No, no, I can uh, see it. No, I can see your whole okay. whole screen there. Okay. <clears throat> At the end of his long career, Jacobus Captain concluded that there were two star streams moving in opposed directions. What? That was his conclusion. So. Well, that's exactly what should be expected in the Tychos. If you recall this uh, graphic, where Joe sees the stars going in one way and Jim sees the stars going the other way. This is precisely what a heliocentrist may conclude unless he were aware of the Earth's PVP orbit and of the Tychos model's geometry. Okay. So he came to the conclusion that there were two groups of stars going in one way and the other in another way 
on the other side of Earth, right? Uh, okay. But his conclusions were, I mean, in spite of him being the most revered, I mean, very, very eminent astronomer and the expert of, of the stars, the top expert, he was then, his ideas were discarded. That, that, that couldn't work. I mean, there was no good. How could there be two groups of stars moving in opposite direction? And there were, I've read all about the, the guys who, 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 who killed his theory, actually. There, were, there was this Harlow Shapley guy who, who became famous. He was a, a right fool. And they did everything to cover this up. Okay? And they call it the captain's failure, they called it, you know. So here we can read, captain's failure to harmonize observation with theory we affirm the anomalous nature of stellar motions and led him to discover in 1902 that there were two star streams, finding that the stars tend to move in two distinct and diametrically opposite directions. That is what should will be expected. If you don't know that this isn't just normal uh, perspective, which will happen if you go in one straight line and you have stars uh, uh, you know, on one side of the, uh, and the other of the world, you're not going around in a circle, you're going in a straight line. I don't know if you follow me here, but this is very important. I really like what Captain, the present, the Christmas present that he gave to the Tychus. He, he did really, he, no one is talking about him anymore today, but this is the kind of stuff you need to really dig for, you know, when you do this kind of research. So to and, make sure uh, that we're getting the, the significance of this, Simon, um, yeah. is this different from is this part of the category of what we were talking about with stellar parallax? In other words, he's assuming oh, that yes. we're, we're, we're looking outward. We're on a track around the sun. We're only ever looking outward. So we should see motions only going in one way, but he saw them going in both ways. Can you? This, okay, this, this explains your question. This one, okay. this other graphic. Very good question, but you know, I was, it took me a long time to, 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 to wrap my head around it, but this is, should be really clear. This is another, the Frenchman Esclangon, who also was an extremely eminent and rigorous astronomer. He was ex famous for being extremely rigorous and, uh, and methodical. And what did he do? He did, uh, it took 40,000 observations, 12 hours apart, looking at the stars around us. Okay, and to his surprise, he his his famous theory or his famous discovery he called it the dissymmetry of space. What was that? Well, please follow me because this should be simple to to understand. This is the heliocentric model. Okay, so let's say that he had two control stars, one here. Control X and Control Y, which were, you know, happened to be right in front of each other like this, right? Let's say he had this X and Y, and he used them to see what's going to happen. It's going to happen in 12 hours only. You know, what happens from, you know, from midnight to noon? And, and so he did 40,000 uh, such observations. 12 hours, 12 hours, 12 hours, you know, many, many, many 12 hours of observations. He, as a heliocentrist, would have expected that from the first observation here, number one, and to the second, both stars would have moved. I mean, this is his line of sight, okay? The, this one, the green one, this. Both stars would have moved to the right of his line of sight, okay? This to the right of his line of sight, and this to the right of his line of sight up to 12 hours, but they didn't. This is what the stars did. Because here we have the Earth, I had to, you know, I had to turn the, the, the Tycho's in this way now. We're going this way from up to down, okay? At 1.6 kilometers an hour, okay? This is the direction of Earth. He saw <clears throat> in 12 hours, control star Y and X. X, he saw, he saw it moving to the right of his line of sight, but control star Y moved to the left of his line of sight. So that was a dissymmetry that he detected. 
He didn't expect this to happen. He didn't know we were going this way in a straight line. So this is not to be expected by a heliocentrist. So he was stumped, called it the dissymmetry of space, published it, and no one understood what it was. And, but the best thing of all is the amount that he found was 0 0.07 uh, arc seconds in 12 hours. That's exactly what is expected in the Tychos. In 12 hours, we will, uh, stars will be seen to move by 0 0.07 because that's the fraction of, um, <clears throat> in one year, we will, we will move by 51.13 here. And that computes to 0 0 0.07 in 12 hours. So here again, we have an eminent astronomer unwittingly, unwittingly corroborating the Tychos. He didn't know what it was. But he published it. He said, it's strange. It looks like there is a dissymmetry. The stars on either side of Earth, they are they, they're kind of moving strangely in 12 hours. Yeah, right? this is, so this is actually data that gets into the question of PVP and what causes precession. If that's the, is that a good topic to move on to um, as we're moving through the, is that, is that yeah, where well, this I, category? I, 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 of course, I can um, talk about the PDP because it's it's important. But sure, um, um, I guess can, that also can... it also goes along with the speed of the Earth and the Michelson Morley. It's basically showing that we're all the data when people are trying to find data of how fast we're going seems to show yeah. that we're moving at this tranquil pace as opposed to what would be required if we're going to make it all the way around the sun in one year's time. Yes, yes. All right, this is a PVP orbit, and this is about the great inequality. Shall we take the great inequality? Uh, because that was a big, big, big uh, debate in the 19th century. Yeah, and it was actually, I mean, it's actually related also to the retrogrades. Right? That is, that is yeah, related, no, that's related to PVP. To our motion around the PVP orbits. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the great inequality was about the fact that they discovered that Jupiter and Saturn were moving strangely. They seemed to uh, alternatively accelerate first Jupiter and then Saturn would accelerate. And according to their calculations, and that would be, be so strange that <clears throat> it inferred that the solar system would, in the course of ages, lose two of its most prominent members that Jupiter would fall into the sun, while Saturn would be driven away into the depths of space. It was that important. And then they also mentioned that it appeared to be inconsistent with the law of gravitation. So it was a big problem they had to solve. Let's solve this thing. We Well, okay, so make a long story short, they never solved it. They never solved it. Well, they, they pretend to solve it, but that's a bit longer to explain. Anyway, I say here, so can I try to explain even the great inequality? Indeed, it can, and in the simplest imaginable manner. And I, I, I trust you will understand this because it's really like, like a child's game. The reason why <clears throat> the, the, the issue was this, you know, they were looking for many, many years of the, at how Jupiter and Saturn conjuncted, you know, and they learned that they conjuncted every 60 years approximately. They also conjunct every 20, but anyway, 60 years is an important uh, thing. <laughs> so I made this example. Let's say we are here at the year zero here, okay? And the guy says, Saturn is slightly ahead of Jupiter because the, the perspective will show Saturn ahead of Jupiter. This guy would see Saturn ahead. He will wait for 60 years, okay? And now look again where they supposedly conjunct again and say, oh no. Now Jupiter seems to be seems to be ahead of Saturn. Jupiter must have accelerated. That will be his conclusion in this case, because he is looking at this uh, quadrant of the sky above, you know, towards the you know, towards uh, Sirius, let's say. Okay, Sirius is up here. But then in another epoch, epoch, the exact opposite will happen. You know, Jupiter is slightly ahead of Saturn. 
And then after 60 years, oh, now Saturn seems to be a, seems to be ahead of Jupiter. Saturn must have accelerated. So this is just a, a perspective game, a perspective illusion that they seem to accelerate and accelerate. It was very, very grave. It was a great problem. They, they wondered, this is it was against even Newton's laws. Yeah, yeah, we are saying that the, the, uh, the planets change uh, speed, uh, they, they do speed up and slow down, but not in this way. This was really, a, <laughs> this was not accepted. Like this couldn't be, uh, you know, this didn't match Newton's ideas. And they, they, they thought, oh, you know what? They made a competition for, for people to solve this. And one of the most famous mathematicians in the world, the Swiss Euler, the, uh, you know, presented a huge calculations he had done, won the prize, but then it was discovered that he was saying the exact opposite. You know, this, uh, Saturn was excited instead of Jupiter, when, whereas, I mean, he, his conclusion was uh, totally conflicting with what was, what the question was, you know. It's a bit hard to explain, but, you know, <laughs> he won the prize in spite of... Uh, completely, you know, giving the wrong answer. It didn't solve the problem. It's funny to read these old uh, books, you know, that they explain these this amazing things that have happened, you know, people getting prizes and then, you know, of course, you, you know, the Nobel Prize is always given to, to strange people, really, <laughs> uh, to wrong people, I guess. Yeah, that's a, anyway. I, I don't understand the Norwegians on that one. Uh, so <laughs> no, I don't but, either. Uh, but I just, don't either. I, just to ask, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed for the Norwegians. Me too. Me too. Well, the Nobel Committee has been captured by. By. There uh, should be the No Bull Prize. <laughs> no Bull. <laughs> or, or some some bull. But can, just to yes. make this completely clear and simple, let me ask this question though: Why does this? explanation you're showing me here isn't it the same for copernican because jupiter and saturn they're going around earth and the sun in both <laughs> of the in both of the models so why you know i see you've got a pvp orbit here but if in the book I explain it a bit better and i see what you're you getting at i see what you're getting at but you, you need I, I just want to make understand. it clear for the listener yeah I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I'm keeping yeah, track of you. No, no. Just that no, it needs a little further explanation. This about the great inequality. You need to know what they were expecting. You see, uh, and I explained a little bit. There is a very famous um, diagram by Kepler, who shows how in 60 years the, these the conjunctions yeah. will happen. So they, you know, they, they 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 had to match their you know their, their stuff. And they didn't match up here. I mean, I didn't invent the great inequality just right. to to make them go crazy. They did it. They they they, they thought it was a huge problem, and that it would mean the end of, of 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 the solar system as we know it. It was a huge problem. Okay. Right, right, yeah. Because it, and it's, it's solved like this. Yeah, it, it's solved. This is this is resolved. It's completely. Yeah, I recommend people no, check it's out. It's the funny thing because we talked about it. Kepler. If you, if, I would, I really want to show you this one. I think this is beautiful. To the right, this white here. This this is it was made by Kepler. It's in the in the first uh, part of his huge Astronomia Nova book. It's it's to be found in his big big big, you know, uh, masterpiece. He did this this drawing of Mars motions between 1518 and 1596. So it's 16 years of Mars. And, and when I tested it in a like, Cosium, look what, what, what I got. You can take, this is identical. This is practically identical. This is what my calculations of Mars in the tech Cosium uh, ends up doing between 1518 and 1596. You can almost paste this upon this. Kepler was a great mathematician for sure. He he did this without uh, uh, you know the help of computers. So, uh, so I admire him for that. But he discarded this. He said, "No, I can't figure out what it. You know, he's not he's not putting the Earth in the middle here. He, I don't know what this really means, DNA. You know, but he discarded this. He, he thought it was impossible. Yeah, of course. And it's strange. Maybe first time you you see it. 
and he uh, and he fudged his data on Mars. It, it turns out as and then as he you fudged it in, the, in your book. He, and that he was all, only found out in 1987, you know, by by the translator of Astronomy and Nova. He said, but Kepler has been fudging the numbers as well. I mean, so yeah, yeah. yeah it was I, a very I find character. it very interesting that uh, in this he it's called uh, Stella Martis. He he calls Mars a star. Yes. Yes. Kepler calls Mars a star, and and in the in the yes. picture there is a little star yes. for Mars. Uh, I, I found that yes. interesting as <laughs> yes. well. So it was a star. there wasn't yeah, yeah. Uh, there seemed to be some kind of agreement uh, back in the 15th century that uh, that Mars was a star for some reason. Yeah, I think they yeah. tended to 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 use the word star instead of planets. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but it's interesting. It's all very very interesting, and and you've presented some really powerful evidence here, Simon and Patrick. I, I do want to move to the moon as the central drive shaft because that seems okay. to be so, so important. But before we get there, the while we're on pleasure. the subject of moon, should yes. we, can you very briefly talk about why does it matter for Mercury and Venus to be moons? Why, why is that such a big deal and not just a matter right. of nomenclature before we get to our moon, which we'll lead up to that okay. moon by talking about those other two moons as briefly as possible on Venus and Mercury so we can really maximize our time on our moon. With great pleasure. We, we, we gloss over Venus and Mercury, but all I want to show here with this slide is that, I mean, come on, Mercury, the rotation speed around its axis is 10.90, I mean, 11 kilometers an hour, 10 and 11, okay? The, the rotation of Venus is 13.5 kilometers an hour, and the rotation of our moon is 16. These are really slow speeds. Every other planet, all the other planets go at, you know, thousands. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, Jupiter and Saturn are around at like 30,000 or something. Really, really, they, 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 they turn, they revolve around their axis, okay? We're not talking about uh, orbital speed. We're talking about the speed if you stand on the equator, you will go at 10.93 on Mercury. It's, it goes, it spins around its axis very slowly. And no other objects do that. How come? How come? I'm sorry if I feel a bit emphatic sometimes when I speak, but how come astronomers never have, you know, looked upon, upon, upon this a bit deeper? Why do they only those two? Then, of course, they, they have noticed that they are the only moonless planets. All the planets in our system have moons, but Venus and Mercury. Well, perhaps because they are moons, right? Uh, logic uh, dictates that. And then NASA says, why Venus doesn't have a moon is a mystery for scientists to solve. Yeah, so they don't know. They don't know why Venus doesn't have a moon. And they say the same for Mercury. Yet, and did you know, or how long have you known, gentlemen, both of you, that Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, just like the Sun. The Sun has Mercury and Venus, and Mars has Phobos and Deimos. So yeah. they are two companions with two chick kids. You know, I grew up. I grew up sense. reading uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' stories of Mars. So you do in those. Uh... He's the same author so you knew Tarzan. About yeah, he talks about the two moons hurtling around All Mars. Right. But, but I guess the point is that <laughs> okay. they're like twins. The moon, yeah. right? I mean, the sun and Mars each have two moons is what you're arguing. That's the, that's the mo most significant yeah. part of that. Yes, and, and, and the very slow rotational speeds so of Mercury and Venus. And then, and, and, and as I showed before, they, um, they're retrograde. Um, periods are exactly at a one to two ratio. So they are very much linked together. Mercury and Venus are two moons. Uh, one has a, a retrograde lasts for one sixteenth of a year and the other one eighth of a year. I mean, what more evidence do you need to show that they are closely related because they're two moons and that they uh, rotate very slowly at walking pace? This is walking pace, guys. Uh, mm. Unlike any other object we know of. 
Well, I think the so moon I mean... of uh, uh, Jupiter also rotates slowly. I think, yes. Mm. Uh, so if it, yeah, so I mean, if if you ask uh, an astronomer to to define a moon, its characteristics, he might mm. say that well, it's it's tidally locked to its host. Also, also, uh, meaning course. it's always showing <clears throat> the same side to its host planet. I mean, we only see one side of the moon all the time. And that is because there, I mean, th there's their actual rotation is similar to its its rotational, to its orbit. It, it, it rotates uh, one, to, does complete one rotation when it has completed its orbit. Hmm. And uh, yes. another uh, definition uh, of a moon would of course be to say that it doesn't have any moons itself because it is a moon yes so uh, according to that definition then then uh, uh, mercury and venus should be defined as moon but they aren't because they are orbiting the sun and everything orbiting the sun should be yes. planets or i, I don't it know and, and there's been yeah, a big just argument to, uh, as well whether uh, yeah. uh, Venus and Mercury actually is tidally locked. They uh, are. To... If they are tidally locked, both of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying they aren't, Simon. I'm saying there has been a no, no, is, dispute said, around that. No, I said is. You said is. No, I said, you said uh -huh, is. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not a native English speaker. No? Sorry. Yeah, no, okay. I got it. I got it. That's, so... that's a controversial thing. They say that Venus uh, rotates in the opposite direction, uh, uh, clockwise, uh, not counterclockwise, and that it's upside down, 180 degrees. That is, that is still thought so. I mean, they still teach that. But this, I think I have I got that why they think so. This is because Venus goes around us. We don't go around Venus, right? Venus goes around us. And it takes 1.6 years, so more than one year to go around us. So when we look, when they try to find a little spot on Venus and, and they maybe see it for a few days and then they see it again, they will think that Venus rotates in the wrong direction. But I think Venus rotates like all the others and is tightly locked. And that is, it is tightly locked to us. That is another mystery. I read it in a recent paper that it's still a mystery why Venus shows the same face to us each time it comes closest to Earth. This is this is a fact, apparently. It is modern accepted facts. Right. So Venus uh, shows the same face to us, uh, just like the moon. And this Every is time so it comes important, closest. which is what it's doing right now. Venus right now is in between us and the sun, and it's swinging yeah. cl uh, closest to us. And... It's yeah. always the same face. So what this is showing is that there are connections in our solar system or our binary system mm -hmm. or our, you know, this, this system that we're in, there are the, the objects are linked and locked in ways that are not to be expected. It, it just gets explained <sighs> as like, well, it's all just a coincidence, but as we're going to, I'm saying this because kind of a transition to talking about our moon, somehow mm. they're all interconnected in ways that don't make any sense. And just as we leave Venus, it doesn't make any sense for Venus to always, when it swings by us, show exactly the same face. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess it's just explaining well, this coincidence. It does make sense if you look at the numbers uh, really closely and, and uh, the numbers of, of each uh, of our solar system bodies, uh, periods. Yes, they're and all connected, what, but they want to teach us that they're not connected, but there's some kind of connection. They're not going to, yeah, we, are, we live in a chaotic system. Uh, you can read many times in various papers. Uh, we are in a, it's a chaotic state and that, that explains it all, right? If we don't can explain one thing, we, ah, it's because it's okay. it's some perturbation, it's some chaotic uh, fact that uh, it doesn't make our numbers match. But anyway, uh, nothing is chaotic in this system, not at all chaotic. And <clears throat> what I found out, it's, this is, yeah, this is my finding really, because I chose to believe and to go with this number for the synodic period of the moon, because 
mind you, the Maya astronomers use this number and others too, I think the Egyptians, 29.22 days. <clears throat> now, astronomers will tell me, oh no, it's 29.5. Well, over longer periods of time, and when you don't, when you consider the, the uh, PVP orbit, or it, will, it, it will make sense that it's 29.22. So and, and you just, show it in the book. You show you show it in the book. I showed why, why because twenty nine, twenty two. Yeah, there is yeah. It's an average. It, it's a properly. So people should probably check that the, out. the yeah. proper average of the moon's uh, synodic period. So what did I do then? I said, well, let's see. see. Uh, what's Mercury supposed to do? One hundred sixteen point eighty eight. Wow, well, that's exactly four times twenty nine point two. You know, I started like this when I <laughs> when I started this research. Then I said, I said Venus then. 584.4. Yeah, they say 584.3, but it's 500. I, I checked that. I checked that, you know, looking at many, many, many periods uh, on the various simulators and the tables, and it, it actually is 5844, not 584.3, like NASA says. Okay, they, these are small details, but I just want to say that for, you know, the people, the nitpicking people who say, ah, you know, Sam, you're using your own numbers. No, I, I Double check these numbers. And it's 1698. So, so Venus is 20 times, the period of Venus is exactly 20 times that of the moon. Mercury is four. Mars, now this could be controversial because the actual synodic period of Mars is 780 or 7, 779. But in the long run, over a very long time, I found that I find that Mars does exactly. It's, a, it's exactly linked to two to one ratio with, with uh, the sun. But the reason why we don't see that all the time, it's because it's a companion. It's a different body than the others. It's not, it's not a moon. It's the only companion of the sun. And we should use this, this number. That's twice. That's two years. Exactly right. And it's 65.25 by two. So I'm. I'm satisfied it's not, uh, you know, a fraud to use to say that that's 25 times the moons. Period. It, it, it can be accepted, I think. But then it gets better. So note that uh, 1.4, uh, 1 plus 4 plus 20 plus 25 equals 50. You divide it by 4, so you take the average of these 4, and you get 12.5. And that's the sun. The sun, the end of 65.25, okay, that's one year. <clears throat> that's 12.5 times 29.22. So even the sun is linked, but like a, like a clockwork, like a gearbox of a car. And Mercedes, perfect gearbox. But then it gets better. Jupiter around 150, Saturn 375. These are all multiples of 29.22. 1050 for Uranus. Then it gets a bit strange with Neptune, 2062.5, all right? But it's exactly 0. 0.5. And then 3,100 for Pluto. So all these, I mean, it's like the, the moon is the central drive shaft. That's why I call it the central drive shaft. Of the, because the question becomes, so the question becomes, I put this in large letters, you know, <laughs> I like a little impact. Why would our moon play such a central role in our solar system if it only were a little satellite revolving around planet Earth, which itself would revolve in the third lane around the sun? I mean, why would the moon, uh, you know, be the, the least common denominator of all uh, the planets uh, around us if it were just an appendage around the Earth in the third lane? It must be more important than that. And, and, and it must be in the center as it is in the Tychos. Here is another, <clears throat> the same thing just illustrated on the Tychos. The same thing, moon here, 29, 22, Mars 25, uh, Sun 12.5, Mercury 4, 20, 7, 5, 50. The same thing just illustrated the, the, the resonances. So we could very well consider the moon as a central drive shaft. So this is so important, Simon and Patrick. I, I think I might have mentioned it last time, but my research has shown, and I don't think anyone would argue with me, that ancient cultures around the world all followed a lunisolar calendar. 
just like the Chinese New Year today, Chinese New Year is a lunar plus solar. The Jesus. Romans, the Roman Empire, had a lunar solar calendar Jesus. in ancient ancient Rome. That's where we get this word in English, the Ides. The Ides had to do with a certain phase of the moon, the knowns. There was there was a different. So they had a lunar solar calendar until <laughs> suddenly one culture get jettisoned that that was the literalist christian after the roman empire after christianity took over suddenly went to this solar only and now we have months but the months are completely divorced from the moon as if the moon just isn't important nobody today except for astrologers really even knows what phase the moon is in from one day yeah. to the other but it used to be that your whole calendar was connected to both the moon and the sun and now we've just we've like said the moon doesn't matter anymore there's no there's no connection to our calendar to the moon anymore unless yeah. you're in the chinese new year or, a, or the lunar calendars it's mm. very interesting how the moon has been just demoted as if it's not important but you're saying wait a minute the orbit of pluto is connected to the the true mean period of the moon What's yes going on yes so it must be uh, yes, it must uh, be important in a in a in a human birth by the way a human gestation period is 10 moons uh, the the time that a baby is in the mother is not 9 months it's 10 moons <laughs> it's 10 uh -huh. <laughs> yes yeah, well, uh, I, yeah, I obviously think that the moon is, is extremely important. And I mean, mind you, it's a huge moon. You know, it's only one. It's, it's, as, it's as big as one fourth of the Earth. I don't, there aren't many moons that big. Uh, just look at the moons of Jupiter, of uh, Saturn. They're tiny. We have a huge moon. We are, uh, the, the Earth-moon system is very special. It's unique. You know, people tend to say, no, the Earth, you know, it's not special. It's just the third planet going around the sun. You know, it's so important. And that's, I think that's been somehow, you know, some people have, they're, they're, they've done it on purpose to, to, you know, to degrade the importance of, of the earth and that doesn't mean you know i'm not the geocentrist i say we are the center of the universe no i'm just saying we're the center of a you know, little gearbox I'm, I'm trying to stay humble here <laughs> we're not that important in the universe we're just one of many binary systems and god knows only if there are many of these and, and many are inhabited i used to, I, I used to be a disbeliever you know, who knows? Uh, I didn't think there could be, you know, other forms of life when I was young. But I've come, I've got, I, I, I don't think so anymore. It, it could be, well be that Sirius C is a twin of Earth and we have, you know, civilization there in some form. But, you know, I'm not going in there. It's, that's not the stuff I talk about. I talk just about geometry in my book and it's enough, you know, already to talk about. So I remarkable. stay, you know, yeah. I, I stay very, you know, conservative there. I, I don't go uh, theorizing what what could be in places we we can't go to, because we can't go into outer space, fortunately. So, uh, and this one is also kind of cute, isn't it? This this yeah. graphic. I mean, just think about this. I called it, uh, this was an early graphic I did, the most lunatic Copernican absurdity. Why? Because if we, are, if we are going with the moon around the sun, as this graphic shows, this is a heliocentric graphic, okay? This is not a Tychus. Then imagine we know, I mean, we observe the moon facing the same star every 27 three days exactly or 27.322 days okay here 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 so so once again you know we we will be doing 70 million kilometers from here to here but we should still still the same star behind the moon and here and here and here and here and here that doesn't make sense so no lateral displacement will will happen 
while we do all this, you know, this is 300 million kilometers. We will see the same star here behind the moon, and we see the same star here behind the moon. I mean, so come that's on. That's a powerful graphic. Now, just to ask <laughs> 300 million kilometers so will change a thing, just, you know, just, not the thing. Just to ask, so now we've we've said 29.22, which is a, the same number that the ancient Toltec uh, and Aztec appear to be using in the sunstone, which we won't get into right now, but yeah, this is saying 27.3 right instead of 29.22, is that because... No, no, no wait, 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 wait. Yeah, go ahead. 27.3 is the sidereal. sidereal. It, it, mm -hmm. When the moon lines up with the same star, whereas synodic, 29.22, and when it comes back facing the sun the, you must Thank you. you must yep. learn that little thing yep. it's the difference between a side reel uh, i think you say side reel in english Sidereal, and yeah. synodic these are yep. two different i agree with 27.3 for the side reel and i agree almost with the mm. 29.5 but i get it to 29.22 okay Good. i just, just to make this make clear. clear yeah i wanted to yeah. i wanted to get to that clarification just so i understand yeah, that, also so, yeah, else. Yeah, so this is a sidereal uh, thing but but the sidereal numbers just <laughs> make no sense if if we're if if we're moving that far you would <laughs> well we have the moon very close it's even closer than mars in, in this mm. you know in this case yeah. mars uh, mars is already pretty close you know so, uh, uh, as with my example with the finger on the on the library but here we have the moon being very close and there must be some parallax happening if you move by 300 million kilometers sideways in relation to a star no matter how the, far that star is oh well they will say no it, no it matters the stars are so far away 300 million kilometers will will count for nothing will count yeah. for nothing yeah that, that's what they say yeah that so i think we've i th I think we've gotten to a point where we can maybe start to wrap it up. I want to um, yes, see if Patrick, certainly. you want to bring in anything else on this evidence before I would like to unwrap just one more Christmas present being that question of, and maybe we could speculate a little bit here, why you would think if you want to, if you want to revisit any of the evidence, Patrick, that we haven't unwrapped completely. Um, otherwise, could we maybe just talk about, an objection that people must be thinking would be, okay, if there's so much evidence, which we've just discussed, an uh, enormous amount of evidence, Michelson, Morley, uh, the sidereal lineups of objects like the moon and Mars, and the, you would think, quote unquote, let me just you know paraphrase some devil's advocate, wouldn't someone other than Simon have noticed this by now and tossed out the Copernican theory? Is it just, is it only um, just a mass of inertia that keeps the Co Kepler theory going along? Or is it possible that things like the moon's importance need to be suppressed or somebody sees a need to suppress the truth about our, if our system is the way you're saying, what what's so dangerous about admitting that? Other than saying you're wrong, because That's scientists it. scientists do have to say they're wrong eventually. You know, sometimes we update our models and say, well, we got to change this. Why is this one so resistant? If all this evidence, as you just showed, is out there, can we can we just talk about that at the as we? Finish. I'll let Patrick uh, yeah. comment about that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, that's that's a very good uh, question, David. And uh, we can only speculate, but I would say that if we look at history, it's it's always been in the interest of of those in power uh, to keep uh, everyone else in as much uh, ignorance as possible because knowledge is power and the interesting thing as well is is this with with religion and belief systems if if you're able to push people into a belief system uh, and 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 they live in in that kind of manufactured narrative you can slowly push that narrative 
more and more and more away from from confirmable truths and actual reality and and then you achieve what you want and that is to keep other people in as much ignorance as possible because knowledge is power if if you know how stuff actually works and and uh, the uh, the other group the group you're controlling they they don't get this then then you you have the edge so to speak and and i mean it might be hard to imagine that uh, this is going on today in our such an advanced age but uh, i've i'm very much of that opinion and and we we can see with the pers- with a perspective if we look at history that this has been going on you have the the um, uh, catholic empire where in the 50th century uh, unicorns were a real thing uh, you could go to the church and 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 buy a health uh, an indulgence letter because uh, the medical paradigm of the time was that that um, um, disease was a punishment from God, but if you went to the church and paid them some money, you could uh, get a letter that was a blessing that would keep you healthy. And uh, people believed in that. That, that was real. Uh, I mean, uh, noblemen's most pride, uh, one of the most pride, prized assets uh, or belongings of a nobleman was a, a piece of a unicorn horn because they were real. You know, and I, 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 I know it's it's hard to to uh, to think this, but but this that that's what I that's my conclusion. You know, and and this belief system is upheld at all costs. They, <laughs> yeah, with all all kinds of uh, propaganda and psychological uh, tricks, they yes. they upheld it. Yeah, yeah upheld it's, it. it's like those very, very ice cube trays. You know, if I can give you a framework that you use to put all your facts into, I can control your conclusions or I can influence your conclusions by giving you a framework that everything gets interpreted by. And we, all, all three of us have seen evidence that false frameworks are being presented and sometimes dishonestly not just not just in ignorance. So this one, the question is, is this being promoted completely in ignorance or is it, are there some people who are promoting it and know that it's wrong? Well, I, yeah, I think that... a few, I think most, most, uh, I mean, astronomers and, and, and other scientists, I don't think they are, you know, we know we are not talking the truth. They, they are, of course, in this and, and, and think they are right. But, but I, I have turned to think that there is a small group above them that, that uh, seeds these <laughs> lies and, and, and give them uh make them give them go ahead simon yeah well i i only have to this to say from a from a perfectly you know astronomical point of view not 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 about power in general but in astronomy what i've been reading because that's what i've been reading for the last 10 years so i have it fresh in my mind it's amazing how much effort they put into ridiculing the figure of Tycho Brahe, for instance. Tycho Brahe is presented in so many places like, you know, he was a drunkard, he liked to eat, he liked to party, he had a milk, got drunk and fell down the stairs. He broke his nose in a duel, he was a fool, you know. And there are even some young guys who have done YouTube uh, videos about Tycho Brahe, the craziest man, the scientist in history. And he's always, you know, ridiculed in many ways. And, and he, from um, serious books to, to YouTube videos, you, there's lots of you know, making fun of Tycho Brahe. But why? I mean, if you read the, 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 ser- the very serious books, he was a very great astronomer. He, he made the absolute best observations ever made in in uh, in our hist in our recent history in our epoch 
So uh, there is not some why why making why why do they make so much fun out of this guy? I even found some portraits that are supposedly of him. He looks like Quasimodo, you know. They, they make him all with with uh, strange eyes and all. There are some fake portraits, I think, circulating because he was a very nice and you know, nice man with a beard. He looked a bit like Patrick, <laughs> and he was nothing, nothing. He was a very, very, uh, very serious man. Uh, apart from his, you know. Uh, he had, okay, he was friends with the with the king, so he had the money and he, he liked to party. But but the the, the 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 emphasis has always been to ridicule this man. And then the apart from Tycho Brahe, the um, efforts deployed to uh, stop from you know as we told as we talked about it before. Uh, Michael Somali, you know, they, they brought in Einstein to say, to explain away why they didn't find the speed of Earth. They had Hall Shapley uh, coming to say that Jacob's captain had uh, completely, you know, he had completely, yeah, he, he, he thought that the stars were going in two different directions, but uh, no, that's because the galaxy is much bigger or smaller, whatever he said. And there is uh, just to say that I've, uh, I've read so many episodes of uh, what seemed to be intentional uh, actions to stop uh, to stop Tycho Brahe's model, to stop the Copernican model from crumbling, because it has been, uh, you know, it, 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 there are so many problems with the Copernican model, and now the biggest problem, mind you which I, I would really want to mention before we finish. The, the, uh, the Newtonian um, theory is in grave danger. Everyone knows about what they're saying, but they don't realize exactly what they're saying. They're saying that Newtonian gravity doesn't function after in the other galaxies. Why? Because they keep seeing, <clears throat> just follow me, this is really easy to understand, I think. They keep seeing planets or stars or going around other stars, and they see how they, they, they're going at, you see, incredible velocities because they think that these galaxies are so far away. So even if this planet they're measuring moves by one centimeter or one millimeter, that computes in their maths to an enormous distance, which means that that planet is going at 300 million kilometers an hour, you know? And that doesn't match with Newton. So this is why they say they are invoking dark matter. There must be some dark matter which accelerates these planets. They go too fast. Uh, they are good. They just not. Um, they don't match Newton's theory. And that is the crisis that astronomy is living now. And they are telling us about black holes, dark matter, things they have never seen, invisible stuff, completely ad hoc fantasies. And I'm not the only one who, who, who says that, who criticizes uh, mainstream astronomy. They don't know, they just don't know that the stars are closer. That's my input here. I would like to say, hey, come and look at my tigers. I'm telling you, the stars are not that, that far. So the galaxies are not that far. So maybe you can keep your Newton theory because you're gonna compute that the planets are going at this normal speeds like Jupiter, maybe, you know? So I think astronomers should even try and listen and, and try and read this book that I've written in 10 years of work, because I, I could even save Newton's gravity, gravitational theory. I'm, I'm, I'm half, only half joking now. Actually, I'm joking. Yeah, but, let me just um, ask, wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. Newton's theory, I mean, Earth, <laughs> doing so this, Earth doing this calm little circle in the Berry Center, would that... <laughs> Would that argue that Newton's laws are not the only thing at work here? In other words, wouldn't if I'm just a strict gravity um, is the only thing moving things around, is the only force behind the motions of the solar system, wouldn't that cause a problem for your setup or would it not? <laughs> well, the question. Well, you know, what I said about the 
Newton's theory. I'm, you know, I, I don't know. I wouldn't even be a good, uh, you know, professor explaining what they mean that Newton's how Newton's theories work. But what I do know, the little I know, is that what they're saying, what they're seeing in the galaxies, is that this planets are going too fast for Newton's calculations, for the, his, his equations. So that's their problem. And this reminds me of one thing I wanted to say when we, when we talked about Captain, you know, Jacobus Captain. You know what he famously said? He said that if we found, if we find out that all stars are binaries, then we will, will not need to invoke dark matter anymore. The problem of we, dark matter doesn't need to exist because he believed in dark matter. I mean, he was a he was a conventional astronomer. He was a mainstream astronomer, but he said that if we find that all all stars are binaries, then we don't need dark matter in our theory. I don't know exactly why he said that, but maybe he was thinking in terms of <clears throat> in, in in sort of my terms that yes, we all have uh, all the stars have binaries, so there is more matter than we know of matter we have never discovered, uh, detected. So, because he's saying that, mm, you know, the dark matter is the missing right. matter in the universe, okay? But there's more matter that we don't see. There are lots, well, what is admitted that there are enormous amounts of red dwarfs, which are so dim that, that they are invisible. So there yeah. is lots of stuff we don't see, okay? And Mars is maybe a red dwarf. Yes, it's not the sun. It's not a burning sun, but it's an old star. Why couldn't why why is that so difficult to accept? It's red, just like red dwarfs are supposed to be. It is okay. It's not burning like the sun, but it's a small, just like Sirius B. I mean, how many analogies do you do you do you wish to see before starting to consider that we are a binary system just like Sirius? I showed you a Sirius system A and B, and then the elusive Sirius C, which they haven't found yet because it's probably hidden in the glare of the big star. So they can't see it with a telescope. It's impossible. It's just too too hmm. close to the star. And the idea like that we we're are... double double is so fascinating yeah. because yeah. It, it, that yeah. matches in with Walter Cruttenden's um, yes. great year arguments mm. and the, the influence of these two stars as yes. we get farther and closer. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, yeah no, I will just say that one uh, big reason that, that um, uh, I, I would say that people find it hard to imagine uh, something else than a heliocentric system, besides all astronomers uh, saying it's heliocentric, is uh, uh, NASA. Because NASA is flying around in space and uh, driving cars around on Mars. And how, how could they do that, Simon, if, if Mars is a star? Yeah. Would, you, would you care to comment? Yes. Yes, that's a problem many people have. Yeah. Yeah. They, they are bombarded uh, every day on the newspapers everywhere of NASA's exploits. So how can you combat that? You can't, you can't just say that NASA doesn't go to space, or can you? Uh, so, well, I would say I would like to, you know, please people who, who love NASA. I could say, yeah, they're just hiding us. It's because, you know, they, they, but they're still going to Mars. You know? they, they know how to, to drive to Mars because after all, Mars is, it, it, it's doing the same thing. I mean, Tychosium shows Mars in the same places as uh, in a Copernican simulator, right? So the actual positions of Mars are practically identical. So why couldn't they land on Mars? You know, that's you know, <laughs> a way of pleasing a NASA fan. They could still go there. But I personally don't believe they have brought four or five rovers to Mars and a, and a couple to the moon. Why, and why do they do that? It's so silly. What, what, why, would you, why would you have a rover on, on a big planet? Wouldn't you just have you know, something simpler than that? Um, or drones, or no, well, drones, depending on the atmosphere. But it's, you know, it's all lots of, you know, it's sensation, sensationalist, sensationalistic uh, stuff they give us all the time. Oh, now we've just landed on, a, on an asteroid. Yeah, we landed on Eros. It goes very fast, but we knew how to actually land it with a parachute. <laughs> oh, oh, and, oh, and unfortunately it crashed. So we have no data of it. 
they go on and go on. They go on and on with those fables and people buy them. Yeah. And well, I, let's you know, make this a finale. Let's talk about astronomy instead, not yeah. about NASA. Well, Two I've, different things. <laughs> I've recently made a video just calling into question just the part about not remembering if you saw stars or not. So people can check that out. We'll, mm, and yeah. we'll leave it up to you to ask the question. That is one thing that oh, yeah. is, is mm -hmm. just so hard to even accept. Could It's really hard for an American to accept <laughs> oh, yes. that that was being, that that was alive. But anyway, we'll set that aside. And let me ask something even mm. more controversial and I'll set it up mm. a little bit, but we've mm. just been arguing that based on your data, the moon, uh, central drive shaft is, has a relationship to the motions of Mercury and Venus. And we've seen, you know, even NASA admits that Venus shows its same face to us, although there's no real explanation yes. under their system as to why it would every time it swings closest to us. How is Venus locked with us? The whole system is interlocked and there may yes. be something like magnetism or perhaps even magnetism at work in addition well in other words the laws of physics and gravity there may be more going on in this world than we've been told if these connections are actually going on and yet we're told hmm. there's no connection it's all just random coincidence it's the third rock from the sun with a moon going around it that moon has nothing to do with Man. Pluto it may be that, and I don't know if you want to speculate on this or not, but it, the question of astrology, which is in India, ancient India, ancient China, the Maya were watching the you know, motions of the planets, maybe not just for astronomy, but because they realized there were connections. There's a connection between the moon, as we just said, in the gestation cycle of every single one of us that was... You know, we were born, and it just happens to be that we're inside our mother for a time that corresponds to the mm -hmm. motions of the moon. Is it possible mm -hmm. that all these motions have an impact on things on Earth? And we've seen there are articles, and I've written in my blog about when when we were first starting to be able to communicate across the Atlantic with radio signals, the the RCA company was finding, oh wow, when the planets are in this alignment we have a shorter range on our radios and when the planets are in this alignment we have longer range on our radios any mm -hmm. uh, any comment on any of that it just seems like there's more connections at work in the in these uh, these big objects moving around than we've been told and and anything that it's like they want to tell you there's no connection but maybe there is a connection any yes, I think it all comes comes to our ignorance of the how the mechanism of electromagnetism or magnetism uh, for short. We, we we really are very far away from understanding how magnetism works on our bodies as well. But we have found some things that are quite um, remarkable. Uh, when, uh, for instance, well, in my book I talk about Halley's comet when it passed in two specific years i think it's 774 and 775 and left traces in in the tree rings you know it, it left something that was detectable by by these um, uh, scientists who look at uh, you know then the chronologists and, and whatever they're called uh, they actually saw that there were traces left over of the passage of a comet and well, that's me saying that the com that hell is passed in those two years, but it did. In according to Tychosium, it came very close to Earth, and ooh, by chance that corresponds to the two years that these scientists have have uh, concluded that something strange must have happened. Now they don't all agree that it was a comet, seri event. Some say it was a solar flare that did that. So they are you know debating. But some are adamant that it was cometary events. Some of these scientists 
this is as much as I know of that episode. So yeah, even comets passing by can uh, leave traces on on all the trees of of Earth. Maybe uh, we haven't considered that, have we? During a lifetime, lifetime that's such uh, just a mere close um, close by passage of a of a comet or an asteroid could do that. So, and I I didn't. Also, I, that sense thing, I didn't believe myself. I didn't think there was much, in, in, so much to be interested in uh, conjunctions between planets and so on. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to study that more, more deeply now. Now that I know, if, I think I know, that it's a totally interconnected electromagnetic system, and so all these forces, all these vibrations must interact and obviously. In, interfere or with our lives or or enhance them or or make them worse or yes so i've never been into astrology honestly but i um, i'll probably be looking into it in my all the years because i've just been a, i'm a very rational man very boring uh, boringly rational researcher so i've been sticking sticking to my geometry to my you know the things like I feel I can touch, you know, tangible uh, yeah, numbers, a little a bit of maths. I haven't used so much maths. Mm. I've just been a, no. more, I've been like a small town investigator. You know, I don't consider mm. myself a scientist. You know, I mean, th I was, I was uh, thinking of this the other day. Can I finish? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. If you think a small invest, a small town investigator, what is he supposed to do when he, he's assigned to to resolve a crime? And suddenly he finds that the crime was not made in the in a small town, but it was an international conspiracy. So now he has to travel back and forth and, and collect things and, and turn every stone in order to get somewhere. And he has to have this stamina and will and patience. Well, that's that's all I've done, I think. You know, I've only you know been a patient, a traveler, not only I mean traveled so much, but I've been traveling also. I speak five languages. So I've been able to, to to read very different books of different authors, and that's what I've done. I've just done an investigation, Sherlock Holmes style, uh, and just hopefully, you know, put the uh, pieces together. How do you say that in English when you put the dots together? Yeah, you, you just said so, it. Just to dots, say that yeah. that's my humble contribution to. Mm. To, to to scientific knowledge. Hmm. It's a good metaphor. No, I would just like to to comment on on David's uh, you know about astronomy, astrology. Sorry, because mm. I find it uh, it's very interesting because in a, a geocentric or geoheliocentric uh, model, such an idea that the positions of the planets and etc. would uh, uh, have uh, affect uh, life on Earth. It it becomes much more plausible than in a heliocentric system. Why why would why would it matter? And as you as you mentioned, David, uh, we can find uh, confirmation that uh, uh, things are affected on Earth by the planetary position. And, and it's interesting because I I was just. Uh, I thought about that paper I found a long time ago that talked about this, about how um, a researcher had noted that radio transmissions are greatly affected by planetary alignments. And it was probably on your blog, David, that I found that <laughs> information, but I didn't remember yeah, that. Yeah. So, no, no, no. That's so, I mean, we have that. We have uh, the tides. Uh, that is very hard to explain because uh, the tides with a, a Newtonian gravity, because they occur on both sides of the of the Earth. So, I would say that it's not, you know, simple attraction. I, I would say the Moon affects Earth ma magnetic field in some way that that causes the that affects both the sides of us. So, and, and then we also have, uh, you know, we, we talked about uh, the chicadas, uh, many animals in nature are following <laughs> for some strange reason, yeah. planetary uh, cycles. And we have uh, 
uh, menstruation. Women usually yeah. have their periods in alignment with the moon. So there are a lot of things. And I, I've been in, 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 in Simon's camp as well, you know, well, you know, what, what would it matter the planet? But, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, thinking about that more. And, and, and also, I mean, astrology is, is such an old uh, uh, science or, or oh, thing. Yes. And, and, uh, uh, actually, I mean, in in uh, uh, Tycho Brahe's and and Kepler's days, uh, there was no actual difference between uh, astronomy and astrology. Uh, I mean, they they um, Tycho Brahe and and other uh, astronomers they made horoscopes for uh, for the oh, Kepler did for the rich mm -hmm. people as an extra. <laughs> way so yeah, yeah. and, and just to go back yeah. again to to um, uh, this thing about the moon which i find so interesting that moon the moon seems to have an impli and i, I just want to throw out something and you know a, a thought a hypothesis what if the moon and the earth are two very old binary companions what about that what about if 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 stars they burn and then they turn into something else what if the moon and the earth are the oldest uh, bodies in our solar system and and moon being the oldest well that that could explain why the moon seems to have so much power over the other <laughs> right uh, and, you, and you link so. in the book simon to um the theorist who talks about uh, stellar metamorphosis. Yes, yeah, st stellar metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. I forget the name yeah. of the researcher, but he shows a brown yeah. dwarf is kind of the transition, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll link to it in uh, in the show notes. But the brown dwarf, maybe Jupiter is like a brown dwarf. It's that's that's where mm -hmm. uh, it transitions from kind of a star to a planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and, it's interesting. And, and one other thing, I'll just say, you know, my own work has found unmistakable evidence that there was this ancient body of knowledge where all the world's ancient myths are based on the stars and heavenly cycles, which includes the cycle of the sun, the cycle of the moon, the cycle of procession. That's all encoded in the ancient myths. And those gods, you know, all the ancient myths, well, Norse gods, there's multiple. Greek gods, there's multiple. Then all of a sudden there comes this uh, literalist Christianity, which is taking ancient scriptures and then interpreting them in a radical way that departs actually. The, the ancient scriptures of the Bible are based on the same system. And I've shown this over and over, and I don't want to hijack the conversation over to that, but it's related to this. What if those ancient systems they're based on wisdom, ancient wisdom, that is related to observing the heavenly cycles and understanding that they have something to teach us. And then all of a sudden, this literalist doctrine comes along, and everyone is told to believe the Bible literally. And that situation maintains control for 15 centuries, 16 centuries, some period of centuries, and then it begins to break down actually right around the time of Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, there's, there, there's starting to be rumblings and people saying, wait, I can't believe this literally anymore. And so yes. they bring out a new, a new faith of really strict materialism that nothing is connected. Everything is, you know, rocks flinging around. And, 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 and if you, and if you say, wait a minute, I think the, the moon might be, actually somehow locked in with the motions of mercury and venus and jupiter and pluto they would say no 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 no, no. materialism says there's no connection everything <laughs> is just a bunch of rocks flinging around in circles you know because of randomness it's mm. like look we we gave you something to keep you away from the ancient wisdom and that lasted for about 16 years when that started to break down we'll go the other way and give you something else to keep you away from the understanding that 
actually things are more connected than you really think. Yes. But, but, if, but if I know that they're connected and you don't, maybe that gives me some sort of an edge or knowledge. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to go too far, sure. but it's, it's very interesting sure. to think about, isn't it? It is. Mm. It is. So I don't know. Yeah, but... no, I, I don't want to go too far either, but I mean, we are talking about uh, astronomy here, and I, I don't want to still, you know, move the conversation either. But I mean, when if if we start to look in other fields of science, we can we can see problems there as well. We can see problems in physics. We can see problems in medicine, and we can see problems in in history, and and anthropo anthropology, and uh, I mean. And that relates to your work, David. And I've been watching a lot of, you know, these um, uh, videos and discussions about uh, ancient technology, and that there might have been uh, a very long time ago a very advanced uh, civilization on Earth that could do very advanced thing, and that could explain uh, things like uh, the pyramid and and other megalithic um, constructions. And uh, so, and and that would also be knowledge. I would say, if 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 my conspiracy theory is correct, that you know, people possessing knowledge want to keep it to themselves and don't want because that gives them the edge. Then th that would also be uh, interesting to to uh, keep us uh, away from. And I, I mean, that's also it's kind of human nature that. We think that we are the most uh, advanced civilization that has ever walked the earth. I mean, you thought that in the 16th century as well, or and and we still think that today. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily the case. <laughs> no, it's so, a great yeah. point. It's a great point. And look, I'll just, I'll give a plug. Um, look, this is a wonderful conversation today. I really like the the way we um, touched on all these things, the double double concept, I believe is very interesting because I'm getting ready to go to the conference on procession and ancient knowledge that Walter Cruttenden puts on every couple of years or so. And mm -hmm. that argues that per perhaps our closeness to Sirius influences, you know, these dark ages versus golden ages. Ben Van Kirkwick will be there who runs the mm -hmm. Uncharted X channel, which shows a lot of that evidence that you're pointing to there, um, Patrick. Give about. him a thumbs up from me. Uh, yeah. He's great. Fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. And, um, you know, other researchers as well. So uh, I will put a link for those who want to attend. That'll be in October in California. But the these questions are really important. They are connected to other subjects. We don't want to get too, too far beyond this. But just once again, congratulations, Simon and Patrick, to what you how you have articulated this and questioned this accepted framework that we, we've been handed this framework and said, you've got to fit everything into this. And even if it doesn't fit, you can't let go of that framework. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you know, the anti-Kithra mechanism analogy, I still think is so important. Um, what you've shown with Tychosium Patrick and Simon is just amazing. Like I said, the ancients would have given their eye teeth for a anti-kithera mechanism like the Tychosium. So I hope everyone <laughs> who's watching yeah. will research this further. You know, we may not we may not um, answer all the questions like how is it working or what does this mean for physics. As you say, we still have to. But this has to open us up to question that the idea that we can, are not allowed to question things is just a really problematic, um, problematic stance yeah. in anti-scientific stance. So thank you so much, gentlemen. I'll give you uh, both the final words, Simon and Patrick, and then we'll, uh, we'll close it off for this, for this particular conversation. Simon, Patrick. Oh, yes. Yeah. Maybe a short thing I want to say is uh, the next time you meet someone saying of course I'm talking about if you wish to show the Tycho to anyone uh, 
if someone tells you, oh, but that doesn't match Newton's um, theories, uh, how would that explain, you know, uh, what is, what is um, the sun revolving around? Well, just tell him, look at series A and series B and tell me how they, they work. They are also, uh, they are similar in size proportionally to the sun and Mars and they orbit around intersecting orbits. Explain that for me, and then maybe you can, uh, you can debunk the Tychos. But before, you must explain why we can see, because Sirius is pretty close, is one of the closest stars we have, we can see that it goes around another companion, with, and that they are the same, proportionally the same as the Sun and Mars. So it's, it's absurd to say, Simon, uh, your theory is worth nothing because it doesn't have a physical explanation. Newton explained it all, but yours doesn't. Well, tell me about mm. binary stars. How do they work? They uh, apparently they all revolve around nothing. Okay, there's nothing in the middle uh, because we we still haven't found a binary star. I think we have still haven't found. Maybe someone has found it, but sh has shut up about it. But do we know any binary star which has a thing in the middle, like the Earth? I don't think so, but I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll be finding one someday in the future. That's all for me. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and I would like to say two, two final, uh, no, three mm -hmm. final things, uh, David. First, thank you for, for having us and, and doing this. It, it means a lot to us. Yes. And if there is anyone in Sweden that is with us so far, I would just like to announce that we are doing, uh, mm. me and Simon together are doing a conference in Stockholm on the uh, 3rd of uh, September, on, on mm -hmm. Sunday, the 3rd of September. So come on, come on over. You, you will find the, yes, the um, uh, information. Maybe you could post it as well, David, in this video, and, and it's available on, on, on Facebook. And uh, as a final uh, thing, I would like to quote Marcus Aurelius, who's an old uh, Roman guy. And I mm -hmm. think I'm speaking for Simon here as well. He, he had said many great things, and I, I, I like this quote. If someone can prove me wrong, and show me my mistake in any thought or action, I should gladly change. I seek the truth which has never harmed anyone. The harm is to persist in one's own self-ignorance. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Very yes. well said, very well said. And yes, please Marcus. send me the links um, that uh, to your upcoming conference on the 3rd of September in Sweden. And I, I will look forward to the day when I get to travel and meet you at some upcoming conference. I don't think I'll make it in September to that, but I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. Uh, um, that would be great. We need, we need to too. have Norse myths in uh, Norse myths <laughs> and looking at the stars and talking about these things. But uh, I will post that link. I'll post the links to these other articles if um, you know help me out. But I'll also look for the links to post them, and mm -hmm. I'll just close by. Uh, also echoing wonderful quote, Patrick, by Marcus Aurelius. He turns out to be an extremely important figure, I believe, in the history of the world, because after Marcus Aurelius, as we saw in the movie Gladiator, look, there was a lot of fiction in the movie Gladiator, but Marcus Aurelius was succeeded by Commodus. Commodus was a by all accounts, a maniac, a very dangerous and erratic, murderous figure, just like in that movie. Mm -hmm. And according to some theories, Commodus was the first emperor who was maneuvered into place by the cult of Sol Invictus, otherwise known as the Mithraic cult. Sol Invictus means the unconquered sun. This is when mm -hmm. the the battle was going on for the Roman Empire and Mithraic cult was saying the sun is the center of everything. This is what took over. It's actually related to what we're talking about in, in a way, but I won't, I'll just leave it at that. 
Marcus Aurelius is an extremely important figure. The transition between Marcus Aurelius and Commodus was a pivotal point in the in the Roman Empire and in the history of the world, really. And hmm. it's interesting that the movie Gladiator centers right around that transition. And it was it was not a good transition. It was a disaster, really, hmm. for the world. And, and the movie depicts it that way. So uh, hmm. Marcus Aurelius, a very important figure and also... Uh, you know, a philosopher as well as a as a ruler. And uh, thank you for that quote, Patrick. Thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. It was my pleasure. I really appreciate your being here. We'll do it again in the future. Thank this, you. This is going to be great. I can't wait to, to post it. Manga right. talk. Pusin talk. Yeah, manga. Yeah. Manga, manga, manga talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.